will now convene the regular meeting of the City Council at 7.40. Uh, would you all please join with me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible, First item on the agenda is the agenda. Councilor Nodell, one more time. One more time, and it's a doozy. <laughs> I, knew you, I knew you'd appreciate that. I move to amend and adopt the agenda as follows. First note, the final updated version of consent agenda item 3.34, the communication from Marie Friedman and Jean Richards regarding Burlington International Airport budget amendment for fiscal year 2019. Note written materials for consent agenda item 3.36, communication from Jean Richards, re request for approval to sign a lease agreement with the rental car concessionaires, Hertz, DGS, Avis, and LRAC, doing business as Enterprise Rental Car, National and, and Alamo, to occupy and operate the quick turnaround facility. Note written material for consent agenda item 3.45, communication, grievance settlement, grievance settlement agreement between the Burlington Fire Department and the Burlington Firefighters Association <coughs> per Assistant City Attorney St. James. Remove from the consent agenda item 3.52, resolution, fourth amendment to lease agreement with the Leahy Center for Lake Champlain, Inc doing business as ECHO from the Board of Finance, place it on the deliberative agenda as item, as item 4.055. Please note, not 4.10, but 4.055 per CAO Anderson. Add to the consent agenda item 3.53, Communication from Jeff Glassberg, CEDO, Real Estate Development Coordinator, and David White, Interim CEDO Director, regarding council update on City Place Burlington with the action to waive it, accept it, and file it. Note Mayor Weinberger's communication regarding agenda item 4.06, resolution contract for the re reconstruction of City Hall Park, Board of Finance, per Olivia Lavecchia. Note checklist for this agenda item. Note final version and title change for this agenda item per, C per city attorney's office. Note city hall park detailed budget for this agenda item per CAO Anderson. Note um, up, updated written materials for this agenda item per CAO Anderson. Budget sources and uses updated and CHP IFL request updated. Thank you, Councillor Nodell. Seconded by Councillor Busher. Yes, but, but uh, President Wright, a question for the, the city attorney. Um, 3.45 is the grievance settlement, and we have not had executive session. Should we be acting on that, or should we remove that from consent? I think the idea of executive session. Please use your microphone. Yeah, um, our office provided two sort of detailed communications and the executive session was a placeholder if it was wanted or, or warranted on the, part, on the part of the council. So it can stay on consent unless, is that what I'm understanding from you? I mean, that was our perspective, but I think we were okay. leaving up to the council. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Busher. President Wright, for clarification, since it's on the consent ag agenda, it, when, once the consent ag agenda is adopted, it would be it will, when we pass the consent agenda, if no one has removed it, it will be passed. Right. Yes. Okay. Everybody understands that. So with that, item number two is the public forum. Oh, oh we have to vote on that. Yes. Thank you. That Councilor Bush, you threw me off, threw me off there. Uh, all those in favor of the agenda as amended, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> and we have our agenda. Item number two is the public forum, and we have a lively public forum tonight, so you have two minutes to speak, and I'll, we want to hear your comments, we want to hear your passion, 
All we ask is that uh, there's no, no personalities are brought into it, be it the mayor or city councilors, that you make comments through the president of the council and that it, we, it is respectful. We want to show how it's done here in Vermont, in Burlington, not the way it's done in Washington. So, so thank you. So we will open the public forum tonight with Ali Zapparo to be followed by Charles Simpson. Ms. Zapparo, there we are. Welcome, thank you for being here. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, everybody make sure that, the, but so the channel 17 and everybody can hear you, please pull the mic from right in close to you. I'm not usually on this side of that table. So. <laughs> Uh, my name is Ali Zapparo, and I'm a resident of the Old North End. Um, and I have the honor and privilege of calling Jan O'Dell a professional collaborator, a friend, and a mentor. Um, I just wanted to take a moment this evening to express my deep gratitude for the work she has done on council. Um, I've known Jan for less than a decade, but I know that the work that she's done, uh, I've benefited from, and that work she's done over many decades. Um, including 10 terms on council, I believe, right? Uh, City of Burlington is not a place where passion for leadership and plain old criticism, criticism works. Uh, we need smart, thoughtful, brave, inclusive, and strategic people, um, and that is the kind of person Jane is. Um, Jane has served on a lot of leadership roles in the city, um, benefiting countless seniors, students, young Burlingtonians, our neighbors who were born outside of the US, um, and a number of other folks. Um, it's not easy being a real change maker, especially when you're not in it for yourself and you engage in authentic governance. Um, and that is what Jane does. Uh, Burlington is a sophisticated, complex city. No other city like it in Vermont. And you need somebody that has the right mix of financial management and ethical integrity, and Jane's always been that. Um, Jane navigates positions of power with a rare sense of grace and humility and takes every decision very seriously. I haven't always agreed with those decisions, um, but I know that she uses her wisdom, experience, and her heart to guide her. Jane has one of the biggest hearts uh, and is one of the most thoughtful, ethical, and um, uh, actually humble people I, I know. Um, so I will really miss you on city council, but I know that you will always be an active member of the Burlington and Old North End community. So thank you, Jane. Thank you, Ms. Zapparo. <laughs> and I should mention at the beginning too that um, absent any objection from the city council, um, we will, I will be um, having item number six, uh, which is council comments on general city affairs be right after the public forum. So we will be, and I, I will expect that we will be talking about our fellow city councilors that are leaving. Um, not that I can order you to not talk about something else, but I hope that's where we use our time tonight. Uh, Mr. Simpson, you're up next. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a city resident and I'm concerned about the park. <clears throat> what can the city do with $6.3 million or $5.8 million, assuming we spend half a million on soil remediation, which it really took citizens to discover this toxic soil? Well, we could cut taxes. Uh, should otherwise rise once a $70 million price tag for the new Burlington High School bites deep? According to the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, there were 359 homeless on the day they last counted in the county. Uh, 1,291 statewide, up 5% over 2017. Cities around the country are trying new methods of dealing with the problem, permanent supportive housing with social services, clusters of tiny houses with shared kitchen and sanitary facilities. What is clear is that the homeless are heavy consumers of medical services, 3,700 for a single ER visit, heavy users requiring 44,000 a year in medical services, and permanent housing cuts these visits, as well as interaction with the law, very sharply. Spending money in the homeless or simply returning it to the taxpayers rather than building a gilded, and let's face it, 
ghastly Las Vegas style monstrosity of pulsating illuminated fountains on hardscape in a completely redundant performance space is a win-win. It's a win for democracy because it means the city will finally take seriously the city and state constitutional requirement that fiscal items that generate signatures for an advisory ballot actually get put before the voters. A win because it preserves the dignity and tranquility of our Central Park for the continued use of children and seniors in historically sensitive and tree-shaded state. And a win because the city will have avoided making a historic, our historic downtown a downtown where an 1816 Unitarian church is the iconic centerpiece. Avoid making this an eyesore that a future generation will deeply regret. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Simpson. Uh, up next is Donna Walters and Monique Fordham coming up together, I presume. So, okay, yep, that's fine. So, Donna Walters. And then we'll hear from Monique. So set, that, set the timer for two minutes, and then we'll start it again for Monique Fordham. Okay, Good we'll evening, first. Donna and Monique. Welcome. You're going first, Monique. I'm going to go first. Okay. Yes. okay. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, members of the council, for your time tonight. Um, the mayor likes to talk about the years of outreach and work expended on this redesigned plan. And yet, after all these years, the city has never really been straight with the public as to where the funds for the project would come from. In fact, for years, the city stated on its website that the park redesign would be funded by the downtown TIF funds, period. Then just three months ago, the free press stated that, quote, according to city planners, almost all of the three to four million dollar price tag would be paid through private philanthropy. A week later, on, May th on January 3rd, the free press printed a correction um, printing a quote from the mayor's spokesperson that said, Burlington's share will likely be a combination of TIF stormwater funds and capital building funds. Two weeks after that, on January 18th, the mayor told Vermont Digger that he estimated the total price tag for the project to be $4 million, and that in addition to donations, the funding would come from property taxes, the TIF, and from the institutional bond, and saying that the price was a good deal. Then on Friday, just days away from this council vote on construction funds, the mayor released his fourth configuration of city funding sources, along with a whopping new figure for the cost of the redesign, which is then now 6.3 million, a two full 2.3 million uh, more than the public had been led to believe up to this point. So today, literally with two hours before this meeting, there is another plan that's come out. Um, that in order to deal with this exorbitant price tag, skimps on materials and eliminates the bathroom, which is one of the prime movers for this in the beginning, which will then be pushed through to next year's budget. In other words, hiding again the full cost of the project. In light of all these facts, how could anyone say with a straight face that there has been a robust public process here? The hallmark of this failed process has been a lack of genuine transparency, glossed over by plenty of expensive, slick PR, and coupled with more borrowing into the future and 11-hour financial shell game maneuvers. We strongly ask the members of the council to speak up for their constituents who never got a chance to vote on this project, and please vote down this astronomical thank, exploding price. Thank effect. you, Ms. Fordham. Thank you. Donna Walters, and I am going to have to keep everybody to the two minutes. Okay. So. So I had prepared some uh, statements, but after going to the Board of Finance uh, meeting just before this meeting, like none of them are relevant. So uh, I, I'm just shocked and appalled at the way this administration does business. Last minute, a bunch of deals. Uh, the public gets no notification, but apparently the, the private partners get notification because they were willing to cough up another half a million dollars in donations. And in exchange for that, we get fewer amenities and a lot less uh, quality in terms of the materials they're using. So I'd like to ask the, um, the city council to not approve this. It's too fast, it's too rushed, there's too many questions, and we don't even know what we're getting. And we don't really know what it's gonna cost us because there's a lot of things we won't be getting that we will probably pay for later. So. I, I, I'm almost speechless. I don't know what to say. I'm just very disappointed in the way decisions are made for projects that there's a lot of controversy around and, um, and you're just gonna rush it and ram it through so you can get it done. I don't know. 
it's not the way I like to see business done. And I think a lot of other people feel that way too. So I hope you, you know, give some consideration to what the people that are paying for this, how they're going to feel about it. They're not going to be happy about it. And uh, I, I'm sad about that. I'm sad and I'm mad. So. Remember in November. Thank you, Ms. Walters and Ms. Fordham. I like that. Brian, we'll remember in November and March. Brian Precourt is up next to be followed by Lauren Glenn Davidian. Good evening, Mr. Precourt. Welcome. Hi. My name is Brian Precourt. My family owns the building. My family owns the building on the corner of Pine and Pearl Street across from Bove's restaurant, the older one there, the Omnium Gathroom building. I'm here to comment on the sale of the municipal parking lot uh, behind Bove's. Um, I sort of came late to hearing about this. I knew that there was some development going on there. Uh, in 2001, uh, I was opposed to the sale of the front portion of that parking lot to Bove's for the Victoria Place thing where the parking lot was reduced from 57 spaces to 30 municipal spaces. Now it's being reduced further in that there's really no guarantee that those 30 spaces are going to remain. We, my commercial tenants use that parking and it, it has a drastic effect on my building. My building that's been there for 150 years and is trying to, to maintain itself in that district. Uh, last week I heard on the radio, at a radio show, that um, the mayor had made a comment that a great deal of study goes into these parking decisions. I find that hard to believe in that the study was done that the Cherry Street parking garage, the downtown one, the mall one, was torn down, this lot is being sold, and the belief that the removal of all of the parking spaces on the south side of Pearl Street was a good idea to do last summer. You're taking away all of the parking for our building. In 2001, when I complained about this, uh, CETO promised me that no, uh, this will remain municipal. But if you read the agreement, and I have, there's ways that they can tweak that. Those 30 spaces do not have to stay municipal. And I think it's a shame what's going on here. I was promised back in 2001 that that lot would stay municipal. And then all of a sudden, well, we're doing it. And if you look at the way the zoning was figured, um, you can finish your sentence. Those municipal uh, spaces were counted into the calculation in 2001. They're being recalculated for the new development. They're double dipping on this thing. I think it's ridiculous what happened with this. Thank you, Mr. Pregard. And I don't think I mentioned the lighting system. I think most people know, but when the yellow light goes off, then you're getting close. When the red light goes off, then your time's up. But you finish. You always get to finish your sentence. That you're. Lauren Glenn Davidian is up next. Hi. Good evening. Good Lauren evening. Glenn Davidian. Welcome. Res resident of. I'm not sure where I live, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Harrington Terrace. Um, so I'm here to um, say thank you to the departing city councilors. Richard and Dave, and in particular, Jane Nodell, my friend. Um, and I have some comments here from Megan Humphrey that I'm going to read, and here they go. Thank you for this opportunity to show my gratitude for Jane's service to the Burlington community over many years. While she began as my city councilor, <coughs> Jane became a friend through mutual interests and priorities. I appreciate Jane's pragmatism her ability to compromise with other viewpoints, her fiscal responsibility, and her commitment to remembering the most vulnerable people in Burlington. I'd like to honor Jane's lengthy history of service, of serving so many of us, most especially the older adults in the city whose voices are often left out of the conversation. Thank you, Jane, for your commitment, and I look forward to your kind heart contributing in other ways in the future. So that's from Megan Humphrey. And I would just add, I think one of the things you learn when you are in politics or observing politics is that issues really never boil down to black and white, even though on the outside it appears that they should and decisions should be easy. And 
so many of us here bring so much thought to what we do and research and a high degree of integrity. And Jane, you are, I think, a magnificent example of a public servant. And it means that you take the hits, but it also means tonight that we give you all the love and appreciation that you deserve. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren Glenn Davidian. And I'm just so glad that I did not have to caution Channel 17's Lauren Glenn Davidian to use the microphone. <laughs> Charles Delaney is up next to be followed by Barb Alsop. <coughs> Mr. Delaney. See him. Going once, going twice, Barb Alsop. Good evening, Ms. Alsop, and welcome. Thank you. My name's Barbara Alsop, and I live right across the park uh, at 125 St. Paul Street, so the park is my front lawn. But before I get to that, I want to thank Ryan Pine for nominating Julie, Julia D.P. I can't even pronounce her last name. Thank you. To take the place that I won as Inspector of Elections. I think she's a wonderful choice, and I think she'll be a great Inspector of Elections. But with regard to City Hall Park, when I read the news that the cost had gone up, over six million dollars, I had a question. And that question was, where's the money coming from? And how much of city services that are necessary will not be done because we're building City Hall Park? I walk everywhere since I don't have a car, and I walk over city sidewalks that are literally unwalkable in the winter. The residents carve out walkways through the snow to avoid the ice and the slush caused by damaged sidewalks. This hasn't changed in the last eight years that I have lived in downtown Burlington. But we can find $6 million to fix a park? I don't think so. I think there are more things that need to be done to make this city livable for the people who live here than to put the money into the park. I also want to make a suggestion that this being voted on by this council, which is going to be changed by one-fourth of its members at the next meeting, is sort of like a lame duck session. And we all know what the Republicans do with lame duck sessions in... in finish. finish your, no, you can finish your sentence. In Washington, let's not do it here. Thank you, Ms. Alsop. Artie Jones is up next to be followed by Kathleen Ryan. Andy. Mr. Jones, welcome. I guess that tells you something about my handwriting. Um, oh, what did, uh, I'm sorry, you, what did it? That's okay. What, 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 uh, what did it say? Andy. Oh, sorry. Andy Jones. Thank I you. I stand corrected. Um, my name is Andy Jones. I've been a uh, farm manager at Intervale Community Farm for the last 25 years, and I'm here to speak to item 4.02, uh, which relates to pedestrian and cycling access for Intervale Road. Um, when I first came to the Intervale in 1993, um, it, was, it was kind of a, a, a little bit of a dodgy place, and there weren't a lot of people in Burlington that knew about it. Um, if you look at it today, it's an incredible resource for the city of Burlington, for all of its residents and people beyond. It's, it's incredible for recreation, natural spaces, open, uh, open areas, food production, employment on all sorts of levels. From my farm, where we employ 15 people and we have 12 to 1,500 uh, consumers a week come down in the summer, um, to lots of other places, um, the Summervale events hosted by our landlord of the Intervale Center, Gardner Supply, McNeil, and the list goes on, Tommy Thompson Community Gardens. Unfortunately, everybody has to drive there. 
because it's incredibly dangerous coming down the hill with no sidewalk, no bike lanes, a uh, road that's in terrible condition. We have teachers who want to bring school groups to the Intervale who won't. Uh, they walk and they, after they do it once, they never do it again. So I would urge you to support the transportation improvements uh, necessary to make Intervale roads safe for bicyclists and pedestrians and to really take the Intervale into the 21st century and make it a place that'll be a, a cornerstone of Burlington's public resources for decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. And it said more about my eyesight than your handwriting. <laughs> Kathleen Ryan is up next to be followed by Charles Messing, Charlie Messing. Good evening, Ms. Ryan. Welcome. Thank you. Yes. Um, I've been a resident of Burlington 42 years, and I'm a landscape architect. I've worked here as a landscape architect. Um, I just got the news that there are, there's going to be major quality <coughs> modifications to this park design. I'm not in favor of this design. I think it's a good design, but I really was concerned when the historic design was thrown out lock, stock, and barrel. There was no resemblance of this design to its historic background, historic design. But what it did have going for it was the quality. Keith Wagner is a very good designer. And he, and I know he used the best materials and the best quality. And to turn around at this point in time and throw out the granite, I know I heard secondhand that uh, the public works or whoever has made this decision said concrete will be fine. They will put additives in it. It will be great. It won't be great. In 10 years, it won't be great. The granite would be there. The granite would last. So unless you want to redesign this park and rebuild this park in 10 years, I think you ought to really think twice. Thank you, Ms. Ryan. Charl Charlie Messing is up next to be followed by Jill Allen. Mr. Messing, come on down. Welcome. Thank you. Not that much time, I won't do all the introductions this time. Hello, everybody. Those I remember, Dave Hartnett, we'll miss you, along with Joan and uh, well, you gave an impassioned speech once about uh, making the park more accessible, ADA accessible, and uh, mistakenly thinking that moving the path over will make it more accessible, but that's not the point. Uh, what's the point? <laughs> You'll be surprised to find all my friends are taking care of the park issue. I want to talk about the free College Street shuttle bus. It's been there for a long time and it's very important to the ADA public, the tourists, the children, the college kids, all the senior citizens in my building who, it being seven o'clock, eight o'clock, they are in bed. But I'm here to speak for them and they're all very concerned. Um, it's a free bus. It's very important. It goes straight to the hospital and the plan is now by the GMT to change it in August, to change it to being charged and not even going up College Street. It's going to start at the waterfront, go to the bus terminal, go to the hospital, go to the mall, go to the airport, and it's just, and of course it's money. They have not raised their fares since 2005. What do you know that has not increased in price since 2005? Nothing. It's their mistake and they must fix that and keep the free College Street bus. It is one of the gems in the crown <coughs> of the Queen City. Thank you, Mr. Messing. That was Thank perfect. Thank you. Perfect timing. We got the little wave hand at the light and everything. I should have been in acting. Jill Allen is up next to be followed by Wiley, I think, reading. Good evening and welcome. 
Hi, my name is Jill Allen, and I'm here to urge this city council not to vote on a bid to reconstruct City Hall Park at this meeting. Um, we're called the Green Mountain State, and we're called the Green Mountain State for a reason, because we like greenery, or at least that's what I thought, until I saw um, plans that indicated putting a splash pad in and paving the park, and that, that really disturbs me, because I live in subsidized housing, and there isn't very much greenery around where I live. So I go to Burlington Parks to experience the green. And if this park gets paved and a splash pad gets put in, then you lose the green. It's like paving paradise and putting up a parking lot, like that song says. And I, one of the things that I and many Vermonters value is, is the city and the state's natural beauty. I mean, that's what we sell to tourists. And if we construct this park whose cost keeps on ballooning and ballooning and ballooning, the message that we're sending is that we don't care about our beautiful green state. We care about building higher and higher buildings. And I don't know about you, but that's not the message I want to send to tourists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Wiley Reading is up next to be followed by Lynn Martin. Good evening and welcome. So I have a lot to say about the park, but I think the most important thing is that um, one of the things I love about living in Burlington is that as, you know, stuff, terrifying, horrible stuff happens on the national level um, and seems to get kind of pushed through with very little resistance, it seems like Burlington, there's a lot of like checks to um, people shoving things through. There's a lot, sometimes it's really annoying. There's a lot of public outcry over pretty much every issue. Um, but it comforts me, honestly, because it means that things don't, decisions don't get made overnight and we don't wake up you know, one morning to find that something that we really, really don't want has been done. And it seems like this is, that's happening right now. It's, you know, the, the public clearly is very conflicted about this park, um, and yet it didn't go on the ballot, we didn't get a chance to vote on it, and now it's being voted on again um, and, and being tried to push through. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that people don't feel great about it. Um, maybe some people do, but not everybody. And I don't like um, the idea that we're ignoring a large contingent of the population, and I think that it, um, it's a slippery slope to pushing more and more things that the people generally don't want. So I urge you to consider that, the fact that there's a lot of anger and frustration and just not wanting this plan um, amongst the people of Burlington when you, when you take your vote. Thank you very much. Lynn Martin is up next, to be followed by Wayne Senville. Good evening, Ms. Martin, welcome. Uh, good evening to you. Um, I'm going to speak on a personal note here for the park instead of facts because I have done this now for three years and I found that I have internalized the park, it would appear in a way that made me rather chuckle. Um, I recently rented an office at 86 St. Paul Street and I was trying to figure out how to do the interior and I thought, well, you know, I'm a therapist and people have roots and they have branches in their lives and all, so I started off with one rather large tree on the wall, which is eight feet wide, it's wall decal, eight feet wide and about eight feet tall, no, nine feet wide and eight feet tall. Anyhow, it now has three trees, several branches, a lot of birds, and for all the world reminds me of the park. And I realized I have brought my sadness about City Hall Park and tried to make it meaningful because I'm thinking it may, we may lose it, and I hope not. I sincerely hope not. But the peace from the nature in my, in my, with my fake trees on my walls, the clients have had a positive experience. I want to, it's like B 
being in a grove of trees, I have lights up for <coughs> plants with flowers, and I don't want to lose that outside in the park. Please leave us our park. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Wayne, Wayne Senville is up next to be followed by Richard Hilliard. Good evening, Mr. Senville. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, first of all, a quick thanks to the departing council members who have also put up with uh, long emails from me over the last years. So thank you for, for your service on the council. Uh, at this afternoon's finance board meeting, a half a million dollars in changes, last minute changes to the City Hall Park Plan were announced, uh, largely apparently uh, from what I gathered to reduce the quality of the materials. It's hard to know for sure what all the changes are because this afternoon's roughly 15 minute presentation was the first opportunity any member of the public and probably any city councilor had to review or learn about a whole series of changes to the park design, just 15 minutes for that. As some of you know, I served on the planning commission for 11 years. Uh, I served on the development review board for, for two years more recently. These many changes to the uh, city hall park design, uh, again, first set out just two hours ago, or three hours ago, call into question the, the validity of the current development approval of the park plan and I believe will require the Development Review Board permit to be modified before any work can proceed. I hope you take this into account before you rush into voting to approve the construction contract. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Senville. Richard Hilliard is up next to be followed by Maxine Holmes. Good evening, Mr. Hilliard, and welcome. Good evening, thank you very much. Uh, just like to start off by uh, thanking uh, Councillors Dean and, and Hartnett uh, for their service on the City Council. Uh, and uh, one of the things about appreciating what people do is you don't necessarily agree with them all the time. So uh, I, I appreciate your uh, discussions in, uh, in good faith. But having said that, I completely agree with everything that's been said by the Keep the Park Green uh, crew on City Hall Park. Uh, I w won't go on about that, but request, would request funds in the fiscal year uh, budget for 2020 uh, to divert some of the money that you've got earmarked for the park to the barn at Shemanska Park, which has been institutionally neglected and can no longer be used for neighborhood meetings. Uh, on a professional note, I, I don't understand why we can't get good bids in this city. Who runs the contracts? We've had the nonsense of a city hall park We've got St. Paul Street dug up. We can't seem to get any straight answers out of Sinex or Rouse or Brook, uh, Brookfield. So this may work in government, but it doesn't work in business. And I've seen people invited to shovel manure for much less. Uh, the public deserves competent financial management, integrity in council and city hall, and that transparency must be a principle and not a buzzword. Thank you, Mr. Hilliard. Max. Just say one other thing in response to the gentleman from the Intervail. About eight, eight or ten years ago, DPW found that the part of Intervail Road going down past the railway tracks was not in the city's software. And I recommend to both uh, uh, Director uh, uh, Spencer and the gentleman here that they investigate that because if that wasn't rectified, that may have something to do with the condition of the road. Thank you, Mr. Hilliard. Maxine Holmes is up ne next to be followed by Eric Hoekstra. Good evening, Hi. again. Thanks for hearing me again. <laughs> um, I was very upset about the park when it first was proposed, the changes, and I'm even more upset now about the extra money that has to be spent as a taxpayer in Burlington. I'm very upset that we're spending that kind of money on a park that really doesn't need all those changes. And places where we need help, such as after school programs, as I was mentioning before, initiating this Icelandic <coughs> program, if you can, hopefully, in Burlington, requires buildings and spaces to be used for people in terms of groups and um, inside in the winter. For example, 
Memorial Auditorium. I'd prefer the money being spent instead of putting a parking garage in Memorial Auditorium, which I heard is going to happen, I'd rather see it be a kept as an open space for people to play and get together and do sports. I'm sorry, but I think we're, our priorities are, are, are mixed up here. I, I really don't approve. And I would urge you not to vote on this. No, yes, and it, I've got, <laughs> you, I would prefer that it goes to the voters with the increased amount of money and see what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Holmes. Eric Hoekstra is up next to be followed by Amanda Hanniford, Andrew Champagne, and Jim Luckridge, and Lizzie Haskell together from the Words 2 and 3 MPA. Mr. Hoekstra, welcome. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Chairperson Wright, I should say. Uh, I, uh, I might be alone, but I actually like the idea of City Hall Park, but that's not why I'm here tonight. Uh, I'm here tonight uh, <laughs> as a 17-year resident of Ward 2 and a business owner in the city to thank Jane Nodell for her long service uh, to the city council and the community. Uh, Jane's been an important leader in our community for more than 30 years, serving on uh, many of those years uh, on the city council and sometimes as the city council chair. Uh, Jane's been an independent voice that has worked across party lines to advocate for what she believes is in the best interests of the city. She's been an advocate for socioeconomic equity, uh, and Jane has particularly focused on the most vulnerable among us, working on behalf of low-income families, seniors, <coughs> and individuals on initiatives such as permit reform, fair and impartial policing, sponsoring dumpster days in the Old North End, sponsoring a resolution to push back on uh, the waste district's closure of the reuse zones, uh, working on inclusionary housing, uh, working uh, on behalf of the family room as it's separated from the VNA, uh, and sponsoring the creation of the Senior Center study to make sure that seniors have uh, stable services uh, citywide. Jane's been an advocate for smart growth, supporting development projects in the city led by private sector, nonprofit, and public sector developers. Uh, like most strong leaders, Jane's made tough decisions on behalf of the city, many times when finding uh, herself and, and the city caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, I think we will all welcome Perry Freeman to the council in April and also acknowledge the enormous shoes she will have to fill uh, when she joins this group. Uh, more than anything, I want to thank Jane for being my friend, uh, and I'm comforted to know that Jane will work as a strong leader in the community, uh, and that work is far from over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hoekstra. Come on up, crew from the Ward 2 and 3 NPA. Hey, hey, everybody. How you doing? We're here to lighten the mood a little bit, okay? Um, my name's Andrew Champagne. I'm here with fellow members of the Wards 2 and 3 NPA. Hello to the mayor, hello to the city councilors, and to distinguished guests here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we have a, th a three-part presentation, and I'd like to start it off by saying that we are obviously parts of wards, wards 2 and 3 MPA, and that's the only MPA that offers a dinner, so it's a really great thing. And we would like to thank and acknowledge Jane's many years, how about 20 years, of service to our neighborhood and to all of Burlington. Jane has stayed committed to the work of City Council through the most challenging times and issues, and we're all grateful for her willingness to be a part of the NPA experience connecting city politics to our neighborhoods. We wish her the best in her next adventure. And at the last NPA, which um, Jane was out of the country for, so she wasn't here, um, we, Melissa Kane made a sign, and it turned out that we needed three of them because so many people signed it. So um, they, say it, they say, thank you, Jane, signed by the members of um, the attendees and members of the NPA. Um, we also, um, this is from Liz C C Curry, <laughs> who had to leave, and um, she just wanted to say thank you and give you flowers also. Jane, so we'd like to present you with the flowers and these three cards and our, and our blessings. So thank you so much.
Cindy Turcott is up next, to be followed by Paul Bushart. Hi, I'm uh, Cindy Turcott. I am the president at Gardner Supply Company, an employee-owned company, and we moved to the Interval Vale to turn it into the agricultural haven and, and um, do a lot of the work that was done to get it to where it is now, the beginning of it anyways. Um, we have 150 employees right now that are driving on Intervale Road. Um, so not only do we want to support the footpath that's there, but we also need a road that we can drive down. Um, we have customers now, we're going into busy season, um, and the customers are already complaining about how difficult it is to come down the road right now. Um, it's uh, basically one way as you go down, if any of you have been on there. It's um, really, really difficult to get down there. And it makes it near impossible for the pedestrians and the foot, the foot bicycles, all of them, that are trying to get down into the Intervale, which is a beautiful place for them to spend time. Um, and you've got the CSA, you have the McNeil plant, we have trucks coming in bringing stuff. So it's basically just um, we're out there giving our support to uh, improving the road and improving what needs to happen for the foot traffic there. And we're in complete support of having that foot traffic there. So that's what I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Paul Bushner is up next to be followed by Carolyn Bates. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. So as a Burlington resident and a business owner, I wanted just to encourage the council to uh, move forward on City Hall Park. Um, I will say um, the current status of the park, in my opinion, is unacceptable. Living with the status quo um, isn't something that as a community we should consider doing. Um, I will also say that I was, uh, was very dismayed to hear the, the increase in cost, although I am assuming, as with most projects of this nature, the cost will never go down. To do it properly, the cost will never go down. So if this is what it takes, then let's go ahead and, and uh, do that. Um, however, I would also encourage the council to look at ways without reducing the quality of bringing that cost down. Perhaps, I don't have the line item on what each, each thing in, that goes into that project costs, but perhaps taking out the water feature, the pop jet fountain, something of that nature, as opposed to compromising on materials. But I would leave it to you as how, how that could work. But I would uh, strongly support going forward at this time to redo the park, make it a, a welcoming place for the farmer's market and, for the, and to invite the community in to use it as a resource. Thank you, Mr. Bushner. Carolyn Bates is up next to be followed by Jessica Oski. Good evening, Ms. Bates. Good evening. It's so much fun to have someone say good evening to you. And I would like to also say to thank you to all of you and for the city councilors who are going to leave. When I'm through speaking, I think we ought to do a standing ovation for all of them, not I mean, we, well, I we've, got, we've got more stuff coming that we're going to do ceremonies on. So. All right. I want to just be sure they're fairly treated. Um, and with me in City Hall Park, um, you know, when I first started with the City Hall Park and listening to you guys, it was $500,000 for maintenance and $500,000 for a creative, inclusive splash park so the handicapped kids, including the Ben Wood Lewis, could use a great place to play. And unfortunately, it went underground for four or five years, and then 2016, we suddenly get a new plan and a new budget. It's now around three million, but that supposedly also includes a million dollar donation. I think we need to pause our city hall park plan, just like the mall's paused, just like the Moran has been paused. We need instead to start immediately to remediate all of those trees before any more die. That is the most valuable resource we have for shade and air pollution, et cetera, et cetera. We need to remediate those trees. And then I think we need to really sit down with a design that works and find new designers or redesign with the people who are here and keep them to a budget of $3 million plus whatever we get in donations and allotments and that they have to stay in that budget. I don't know why that wasn't done before. I have just no clue 
or why they kept creating and never telling us that there was a new cost. It was right up front. We need to keep all the remaining trees. We need to be sure that if we put in a splash pad, it's creative. Thank you. Is that the end of me? Thank you. The end of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bates. Jessica Oski, to be followed by Michael Long. Thank you, Mr. President. I like saying that. <laughs> Um, I want to take a minute or two that I have as a longtime resident of Burlington to thank Councillor Nodell for her years of service, tireless and thankless service, to the city of Burlington. Councillor Nodell's years of experience, her brilliant mind, her patience, her integrity, her strategic thinking, her progressive values of inclusion, fairness, and transparency, her deep love for the people of the city, and most importantly, her mad leadership skills will be sorely missed by this counselor, by this council. Councillor Nodell leaves a huge hole that won't be filled anytime soon. In my opinion, Councillor Nodell is even a greater loss by a nose to this city than it would be for the city to lose you, President Wright, which hopefully won't be happening anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Nodell. Um, I will miss your leadership, but I will look forward to your future contributions to the city, which now can be schemed on Monday nights. Thank you, Jessica. Michael Long, welcome. Good evening, and thank you again. Uh, just three things strike me about the, the park plan. The park plan uh, was secretive, heavy on hardscape, and exorbitantly priced to begin with and now it has morphed into a plan costing millions more than advertised. Uh, also, 3,300 voters urged reconsideration of this plan, far more than typically vote to elect a city councilor. And a uh, third item strikes me is that uh, this is the last meeting of the city council as currently config configured, and three of the four whose seats were contested this month will no longer be councilors next week because in at least half of the four two-ward legislative districts, voters have resoundingly chosen new councillors to represent them. It would seem that no rational analysis could conclude that tonight is the night to approve a divisive, controversial, and fiscally stressed park plan. Uh, each and all of the factors noted above make it incumbent upon the council to refrain from any approval of the park plan tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. Karen Long is up next to be followed by Steve Goodkind. Good evening, Ms. Long. Welcome. Thank you. There's not a lot left to say, but I do come uh, because I'm super frustrated with our sidewalks, um, the sidewalks that we need to walk to school, we need to walk to work, we need to walk shopping, out to dinner, whatever. Um, yet, yeah, we're talking about tearing up the sidewalks in City Hall Park, and I've walked all those sidewalks, and in the center of the park, there is one that has a big section of cement missing, but if you walk on Union, Loomis, Winooski, um, Pearl, any of the streets around here, probably every, you know, I mean, there's just huge, huge amount of very unwalkable sidewalks, so that is a huge like frustration to me that we have $6.2 million to tear up the historic park that many, many <coughs> people love, uh, get rid of the tree, 50% of the trees that are providing shade. I mean, again, you've heard this and heard this, but I just don't get it. So please reject this plan. Um, most designers, and I've been in the design business for 40 years, um, do have a bit of a budget. We paid $750,000 for this design, and if the plan was going to be three to four million, that is 25% design fee. I mean, I've never made that much money um, on a design fee. Um, I doubt Richard Dean has either. Like, that would be building a $500,000 house, and you pay your architect $125,000. I mean, we were really misled with this, and please, it's no reason to go ahead with it just because we already wasted 750000 So our streets are crumbling, our sidewalks are bad, and you need to serve us more than we need to serve um, 
you know, tourists that might think a splash pad is fun. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Long. Steve Goodkind is up next to be followed by Kelly Devine. Good evening, Mr. Goodkind. Welcome. Good evening, and thank you, President Wright and Councilors Nodell and Hartnett. Um, during my time as City Engineer and Public Works Director, I was responsible for scores of capital projects. And I know an unsuccessful bid process when I see one. And I think it's time for the city to recognize, for various reasons, and maybe even for all good intentions, that the bidding process so far for City Hall Park has been totally unsuccessful, and it should not be a basis for moving ahead. We should learn some lessons from it. I think by now most people recognize it needs additional design work, it needs value engineering, and not just work done over a few weekends, but it needs a serious effort. Under no circumstance should either of the two bids become the basis for a contract, a negotiated contract for construction. They're way out of line. My personal feeling is neither of them were actually a serious bid, and we've seen it before. I think these were thrown out there, and I don't think either contractor intended to get this job, and they should not become the basis for that. I think you've got to have the courage to go back and let this process go through like a normal project. Only for political reasons would this thing go forward. It makes no financial or engineering sense to use what you have now. It's time just to go back, take a breath, and do this right. And by no means to just negotiate a quick contract and go forward. You're asking for nothing but trouble. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodkind. Kelly Devine is up next to be followed by our final speaker, Susie Sugar. Good evening, Ms. Devine. Good evening. You have your voice back. I know, but just, just barely, right? Um, so uh, I sent in some um, written remarks, so I won't go to the, uh, the trouble of having the audience listen to them all, but um, uh, we've been involved in this City Hall Park project since 2009, I think, um, and uh, in, in, in main part because I do think that a city as wonderful as Burlington needs a great green space. And um, I don't think we have that now. With the existing City Hall Park, there are significant drainage issues with the park. Uh, there's stormwater runoff issues, and uh, my organization's also really concerned about lake health. And so we need to do something. Um, I'm really uh, not in any position to comment on the budget because I haven't looked at it in any depth. But I do know that uh, we did have an extensive process. We did have a vote by the city council to move forward on the project. And um, I do hope that the council can find a way to continue to move it forward tonight. I did get an opportunity to take a look at the amendments. And one thing that our organization has also been working on is, uh, along with Council Roof, is this initiative to try to make more public bathrooms available in the community. So if the council does see fit to remove that item tonight, I hope that, that we can continue that work because we do know um, from pretty much, one, maybe one of the few uh, issues that I think the community is really united on is that we do need more public uh, bathrooms available for downtown. Uh, so I would urge the council to move forward. And uh, I have 27 seconds left to say that it's been my honor uh, to work with Councillor Nodell, Councillor Hartnett, Councillor Dean. Um, you guys have just done an amazing service to the community, some of you for many, many years, other you for a shorter period of time, but uh, it's just been a real honor to work with you and thank you so much for your service. Thank you very much, Ms. Devine. Susie Sugar is up next to be followed by our final speaker, Patrick Dunsey. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, I'm Susie Sugar. I'm here to hug our park trees and our collective wallets. I've been here once before. It was to speak out against the massive construction downtown. And I'm here again for the same reason. For every person speaking out, there are dozens and dozens and dozens who have elected you to represent them who are wondering, how come with 3,300 people signing a petition, this is not being decided in a democratic process? I wasn't entirely against the construction downtown. I'm not a hold on to things that need work. I think there is some work to be done in the park, but the costs here, I think, are exceeding the return to the community, especially when we think about having fewer potential vendors at our famous farmer's market. That's so upsetting to me. In a town where you can't add an extension onto your driveway because you're adding more concrete, we're thinking about adding a massive amount of concrete and that just confounds me. 
Um, no one is moving to Burlington because of that park. Let's be clear here. We have other pressing issues in our community. And no one is skipping our farmer's market because of that park. So I would say let's try to figure out some better things to work on. Let's reprioritize and let's maybe regroup and reject this proposal for now and do better as a community. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sugar. The final speaker tonight is Patrick Dunseith. Mr. Dunseith, welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Patrick Dunseith. I'm the land manager at the Intervale Center. Um, and I'm here just to speak to briefly to the bicycle and pedestrian access study. Um, Intervale Road is the point of access to the largest contiguous block of open space in the city um, at its southern end. Um, and this landscape and uh, the Intervale Center's role um, in managing that landscape are key contributors to the city's reputation as a sustainable and green city. Um, the Intervale continues to rank as a favorite outdoor space um, to Burlington residents. And your support for this road study will continue to show a commitment um, from the city um, as, a, as a sustainable and green, green city. Um, we believe at the Intervale Center that local food and recreation and open space are all huge draws to Burlington and contribute um, to folks moving to Burlington to work and live. Um, As a testament to that, we've just completed a, a fundraising for a million dollar capital campaign um, to enhance some amenities that we provide to the public for free, um, including trails, gardens, um, meaningful opportunities to connect with sustainable agriculture and food. Um, there are CSA pickups, there's scientific research between UVM and Extension, um, and meaningful opportunities to be employed in agriculture. Um, so. Like I said, we're committed to providing these amenities to the city, um, but we need the city's support to do that um, in an equi equitable and safe uh, manner. Um, I'd also like to say, too, that we are con committed to supporting this in whatever way possible, um, and we plan to establish a roadside path um, as part of this, which we'll see in the um, scoping study. Um, as, as a contribution. Thank you, Mr. Dunsey. And with that, we will close out the public forum, and I will look for a motion on the consent agenda before going to item number six. Councillor Nodell. Yes, President Wright, I move that we adopt the consent agenda as amended and take the actions indicated. Thank you, Councillor Nodell, seconded by Councillor Busher. All those in favor of the motion to pass the consent agenda and take the actions indicated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have passed the consent agenda. And now we will go to item number six, which is city councilors on general city affairs. And uh, I, I'm going to take the, I'm going to, I'm going to start on this one. So these flowers are from the city council for our departing city councilors, but even more for the city councilors, they're for your spouses. <laughs> Counsel <laughs> Councilor Busher started this really many years ago, and um, so it is our way of saying thank you to your better halves for allowing you to spend all this time here with us and on your constituents' behalf and on Burlington's behalf, um, we, we really appreciate it. And we do have one spouse that is actually here tonight, Lisa Hartnett over here. And, 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 and I just gotta say, if anybody deserves a dozen roses, it's Lisa Hartnett. <laughs> I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, so let's, let's, uh, let's start with Councillor Hartnett. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, surprised, but happy to see her. Uh, if you want to blame it on anybody, Councillor Hartnett, I got her here. That's okay. <laughs> all through the community, for all the years I've been on the Council and the Parks Commission, and I, all the people I've dealt with, and, and they've met, obviously, me, and they've met my daughter, Katie, a lot. And, they, and that famous question would always come up, Dave, is there really a Lisa Hartnett? And <laughs> there is a Lisa Hartnett, and if it wasn't for Lisa Hartnett and my daughter, Katie, I would have never been able to serve uh, the eight years on this council. They literally have been my strengths, my inspiration for me to do this. Uh, they've been my partners. Uh, it's been incredible uh, to have them by my side through the eight years. It's been one of the most unbelievable experiences in my life. Other than being a dad, I would say it tops the list. Um, I would certainly like to thank the people of the new North End who have supported me in so many ways, just not at the ballot box, but my entire family, and, and embraced uh, us in good times and in bad times. And uh, we have developed a uh, partnership up th out there that we have been through a lot together. Um, I'll never forget their gratitude. I will continue to work hard and advocate for the people in the North End. It's a very special place to live, uh, and I've enjoyed it uh, so much. Um, I also uh, would to, like to thank my mom, who is probably listening and watching on TV. And I got my standard call at 6.30 tonight to say, behave yourself. I'm, <laughs> I'm watching. Uh, <laughs> It's amazing to have a mom that's 90 years old and has, uh, uh, has enjoyed city politics as much as she has, has worked at the polls, who loves this city as much as I do, uh, has been at the same house on Brooks Ave for 57 years, and it's just been an incredible run to have her part of this as well. And um, also would like to thank my sister Mary, who is the youngest in the family out of eight, uh, and, and the only, uh, only daughter who has given my mom the most quality of life anybody could ever ask for. And from a brother's standpoint of view and for the rest of my brothers, to be able to know that your mom is getting a quality life at the age of 90 and is being well taken care of, and that has allowed me to serve here on this council, I would like to thank my sister Mary. So thank you for that. And lastly, the city clerk's office and their staff for all the work they've done for me over the last eight years. You guys have been great. I appreciated it so much and I'm going to miss you, but I'll be down to visit and uh, hopefully it's just a short tender away from politics. I'd like to come back and serve. I love this city. It's amazing. I've said this a thousand times. I'll say it one more time tonight. I think Councillor Paul and Councillor Mason can relate to this. But there is nothing more humbling to grow up in this great city, attend public schools, play Baja hockey, Little League baseball, whatever it might be, run a business for nearly 20 years, have your family grow up here, have your daughter go to the same school you did, and then be able to come back and serve your community. There is nothing more humbling than that. I appreciate it. I love this city, and I think we're in a good place, and I hope to be working with you guys down the road. Thank you very much. Okay, who wants to try to top that? <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Shannon, uh, Councillor Dean, Councillor Dean. Thank you, President. I, I, I don't think I can top that. Um, it's uh, it's a, a, mo a moment now, and I'd like to note that this is probably a, you know, it's not my choice to be leaving this council. Uh, I've only spent a short time here. Um, but I want to th say thank you to my constituents um, who have supported me and given me projects to work on during the time that I've been as part of this council. Um, I, I really hope you know, that, that uh, this has really been a lesson to me about uh, city government and how important we all are and all of you are um, to, making, to understanding the needs of the city and, and, and making the voices of our constituents heard. So 
Um, I'd also like to say um, what a lesson it has been for me in the past two years about how complex this city is and how dedicated our city staff is to making this city go. Um, I have seen them in action. I've worked with uh, DPW on a number of issues. It, it's a really complex mechanism. I didn't learn it all, um, but I do understand how important it is the dedication of the people who work for us to making this city uh, a place that we like to, like to be in and like to live. And um, of course, I have to offer a, a thanks to my family and particularly to my wife. Um, I will be welcomed, I think, with those dozen roses. I may not quite be enough. I may have to do a few <laughs> more dinners uh, to make this up, but um, it, it has been, uh, and, and, and I think everyone should know that every one of the, the members of this council make significant sacrifices to be part, to provide public service, to be public servants. Um, and finally, I would say thank you to all my city council colleagues. Um, it has been an amazing experience to learn from you, to understand the depth of knowledge that you have about this city, um, and to try to keep up. And I know that I haven't quite done that <laughs> as best as I, as I would hope for myself, but um, you are a real inspiration to me. Um, I'm um, you know, sorry to be leaving and not having the opportunity to continue to work with you, but I do plan to stay engaged with this city. You will see me back here on occasions when things uh, are important. Um, and I thank you for all of the lessons that you've taught me over the past two years. Thank you, Councillor Dean. Councillor Shannon? I think she, yeah. uh, thank you, President Wright. Uh, there's been a long tradition on the City Council of giving councillors plaques when they are departing the council, but I understand that this year the cost of the plaques is being donated to City Hall Park. <laughs> and I didn't... <laughs> Good one, Councilor. But I, did, I didn't want our departing counselors to go without. Um, and I spend a lot of time with high schoolers these days, and I noticed that what they do to honor um, their fellow teammates in most cases is they give paper plate awards. Um, so uh, I'm sorry to say that I came up with my paper plate awards uh, ideas at about 5.45 tonight. Um, and I... I think I failed art class, but I did the very best that I could. And I'd like to start with Councillor Dean. Um, Councillor Dean, you really have brought an intelligence and your heart and soul to this effort. And I've learned a lot from you, and I think the council has greatly benefited from your skills um, and your courage when you you know, you were one of the first counselors really to get on board with the idea of renovating our high school, school which was a hard decision for us, and we've had many hard decisions along the way. Um, but you've really used both your intelligence and your heart in the decisions that you have made, and for that reason, uh, you, uh -uh. you are going to get the Tin Man and Scarecrow Award. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Hartnett, you're the one who fears me most, I suspect. <laughs> There's a lot of things I could say, but it's all on videotape. <laughs> except there's a few things that are not on videotape. And one of them is the work that you do outside of this room. And uh, probably a lot of people know that you <coughs> knock on a lot of doors because a lot of people must have answered those doors, including people in South Burlington. He cannot stop. He does not stop in the New North End. He doesn't stop at his own campaigns. He knocks for a lot of other people's campaigns, probably all over the city. But he has even gone so far as to knock on doors in South Burlington. And for that, you will get 
the Door Knocker Award. First place. <laughs> And Councillor Nodell, you might fear me a little bit, but not as much as Councillor Hartnett. Um, I have always admired your courage. We all make a lot of hard decisions on this, on this council, and as has been recognized by the public tonight and others, a lot of times the answers seem very simple, and they're not. Uh, and it's been difficult, and you have stood up for what you believe in. Um, in Burlington, I think that we all know that we stand up against racism and sexism and all the other isms. There's an ism that has not yet been identified, at least in like terminology and a word for it, and you've stood up against that too. In other communities, it might not be deserving of an award, but in Burlington it is. And I think that uh, Councillor Wright should Open that and you can present that award to Councillor Nodell. You can pull it out, <laughs> pull it out. It's wet, which is why it's in there. The glue didn't dry, sorry. My friend is a Republican and I'm not afraid to admit it. I think maybe she should have been afraid. <laughs> Although, one correction. I, but first of all, Councilor Shannon, that's a pretty darn good job for 545 today. Yes, it is. Yes, I, I got to say, that the only thing I'd correct is I don't think Councilor Nodell is afraid of anything. <laughs> but, uh, okay, great job, Councilor Shannon. Who's up, who's up next? Councilor Pine. I should have yielded the floor to Councillor Nodell, Mr. President. Did she want her to go in that order? Okay, all right. Um, I don't want to speak long because it's it's getting on there and we have a lot of business ahead. But I want to thank each councillor by just saying almost a word that I think will typify their service or something that they can be proud of. And I want this community to know that. And I actually think that Councillor Dean, we have to thank for the, uh, Councillor Shannon mentioned the high school, but I really think at the most pivotal moment when the, when the decision could go either way, Councillor Dean spoke up at a time when it wasn't the most popular thing to do, but he did it in a way that was brought everyone along and brought us to the point where we're gonna have a, a, basically a new high school for the youth of Burlington. So I will always think of him as that person who was there at that pivotal moment. Uh, Councillor Hartnett, before he even got on the council, I used to actually fight with Councillor Hartnett over um, balls and strikes and stuff at Little League, but, but then I got to know him better. And Dave came once and spoke before he was a counselor that Burlington needed a, a place where homeless people who couldn't quit whatever substance they were abusing could go. And Dave said, we're gonna get a warming shelter at some point. And I thought to myself, now there's somebody who's driven by a certain set of values, but I'm not sure he's realistic about that. We may never see a warming shelter. And I, I got to give Dave credit because we do have a warming shelter partly due to his advocacy, and I want to thank him for that. Uh, Councillor Nodell, I actually, um, I've known her for so long that I, I have a long list, but I'm just going to say, Jane's ability to take an issue and dig as deep as possible and then look at all of us and say we actually have to go a little bit deeper to get to the root of the issue has always amazed me, and that Jane's ability to do that in a way that is uh, respectful of people with different, different opinions and gets us to a point where we as a group can come together is uh, something that I'll miss a lot. So I just want to thank her for that. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> Councillor Nodell. Thank you, President Wright. I feel really overwhelmed. Um, I just want to say I'm, I'm happy I didn't put my mascara on tonight because, you know, it'd be a big, real big mess. I um, uh, just want to really appreciate, and I'm just so humbled by everything that people have said in public forum and that my colleagues have said. And um, this is a very strong and effective city councilor, and it's council, and I'm really impressed with the work that we've gotten done in the last two years. Um, I'm extremely humbled and appreciative that people have, have voted for me and have trusted me to represent them. 
um, and it is extremely important work and it is, we should not take a high functioning city council and high functioning city government for granted. Now, if people can hold on to the end of the meeting, I have a few more substantive remarks to make, but I'm gonna keep it at this for now um, and just say thank you so much. Thank you to Ted, um, thank you to Jassy, and, um, and uh, th thank, you, thank you to the mayor. We've had our ups and downs um, and I greatly, greatly admire your hard work, your work ethic, and you, you never give up. And I think that's, that's important in this business. Thank you very much. Anyone else on the council? Councilor Busher? Um, yes, I, I won't take a lot of time, but um, I just wanted to say briefly um, something about each councillor. Um, I'll start with Councillor Dean. Um, I, um, we've been together on some really difficult issues, um, and um, I, you are a rational voice, a really good listener, come up with really good um, possible solutions. Um, and I really valued that. And I think that the trio for Ward 1 and 8, Adam, Richard, and me, we were a good trio, and we served that, that NPA well. And I, they will miss your voice. And, um, and so thank you very much, and I just wanted to let you know that. Um, Dave, um, you're amazing in so many ways. You're scary sometimes for me. Um, sometimes you're passionate, and so sometimes you bring me back to, and I'm going to compare you to someone maybe you'll like or not, but to to Mayor Sanders when I would sit here and he would be s sitting across where the mayor is right now, and I would be sitting where Brian is, and he would make some statement, and it would be, oh my God, I'd be so mortified, I'd want to hide under the desk. <laughs> and then other times, his insights and his, and his awareness, and he had his finger on the pulse, and that's you. You're a mix of, of sometimes some things that are maybe not so right, and other things, <laughs> uh, some things that are really spot on, and really, I think back to the serious issue with, with the um, unfortunate death in the New North End with a, a, a person who was having mental health issues. And I, and I look to you as to beginning the dialogue between police and, and people with mental health issues to make it safer and better so the outcomes wouldn't be always what happened there. And I will never forget that. Um, and the other thing, I will never, um, I won't hear an ad without thinking of you. And that ad will be, guess what day it is? <laughs> it's hump, hump day. day. <laughs> <laughs> because of the interruption for poor Megan Tuttle in the no, presentation. <laughs> She's coming back tonight, so let's hope this doesn't happen again. But anyways, Dave, it's been a pleasure sitting um, beside you. And you had your roots in Ward 1, yes. as you know, as as did Richard Dean. Absolutely. Thank um, you. I'm taking more time than I said. I'm sorry, President Wright. Um, it's really hard to, to really put into words um, my relationship with Jane or, or um, Councillor Nodell. We are the yin and the yang of the council. I say too much, she's very succinct. We have very different styles, and yet we have found a working relationship um, that I think has benefited um, the Board of Finance and the Council and the community. Um, I really, really value, I think Brian Pine said that too, I'm calling people by their names because that's what I feel this is about. We're people, not counselors right now. Um, I, I feel that, that Brian was absolutely right at the depth that Jane, when Jane at the Board of Finance, when there's an issue, she will go get well research it and then come and ask questions. They're not frivolous questions, they're meaningful questions that really just move us to a better place and that will be missed. 
um, I really want to thank you so much for everything you've done and your friendship. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Busher. Councillor Tracy. Thank you, President Wright. Um, so um, I just want to say a few words about each councillor because I've had some great interactions with each of you individually. Um, I'll start with Councillor Dean. I very much enjoyed serving on the License Committee with you. I certainly appreciate um, the fairness uh, and the eye towards safety that you've had on that committee. In addition to that, I very much appreciate uh, and value what you did with the Burlington Wildways. I think that that is probably your biggest achievement on this council and one that Burlington will be grateful for for generations to come in the sense that it will, I think, lead to, to not only making, uh, not only preserving um, beautiful open spaces, but also making them more usable in a, in a way that's sustainable for, for Burlington residents. So thank you very much for that. Um, Councilor Hartnett, um, I, You've been an incredible uh, sparring partner, especially on issues of having to do with transportation. I know we see things very differently when it comes to that, but I think in that, in that sparring and in that conversation, you've taught me a lot, not only about um, those issues um, and helped me to, to sort of check my own, my own perspective, uh, giving me sort of reason to, to think deeper and to, to really see it from the other side, but you've also uh, helped to educate me about your neighborhood and the people that you represent up in the New North End, and I think that this council will sorely miss your stores, your stores eye view uh, that, you prevent, that you present to this council. I think that there's tremendous value to that. I think we have a wide range of different personalities on this council. Uh, and yours is certainly very unique in the sense that you uh, bring that sort of, you know, you know, that perspective of someone who's constantly interacting with just average Burlington residents on a day-to-day -day basis in the context of your store, in the context of the high school, and just in the context of your life, because you really reach out to people and take care of people uh, on a smaller scale, not just on these big policy scales. So I'm going to miss, you know, seeing you on, the, on these, miss serving with you on the toque, and just thank you for that. Thanks, Max. Now, with Councillor Nodell, I think that to say that we have a complex dynamic uh, <laughs> would be an understatement. Um, and, um, you know, it, to be totally honest, it's been, you know, difficult at times between us. And I think that you also have taught me a lot. You also have helped me tremendously in this role. And in that complexity, I, I hope that it, it's not lost um, that I recognize and truly value what you've done for the old North End for decades. Um, whether it is the expertise that you've brought on the Board of Finance, helping normal citizens to understand complex financial issues through your professorial, uh, teacherly way of breaking down things and helping you know, normal people understand those issues to actually serving and getting your hands dirty like we did last summer together in the Old North End on Dumpster Day, which is something that you did that I think also in a very different way helps to support the quality of life of residents in the Old North End. So I hope that by no means do, 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 do you forget that I value and, and truly recognize the intelligence that you bring, the tremendous political acumen. That's not something that I'll miss because you've run circles around me time and time again, and you're brilliant at that, uh, and just the, the dedication to the Old North End, and I, I really appreciate that. So thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Tracy. Any other counselor before I go to the mayor? All right, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> um, well, thank you, President Wright, first of all, for uh, continuing this, uh, I think, really um, thoughtful and important tradition uh, when we do have counselors departing, and uh, especially uh, three counselors who have given so much to the city. Um, uh, so first, I'll, I'll uh, and I will say a few words about each of you as, as well. I'd like to say to uh, Counselor Nodell, um, that uh, I feel very fortunate to have served uh, together um, over most of the time I've been in, uh, in, in public uh, life over the last seven years. Um, I'd like to think we had more, more ups than downs and uh, certainly feel that uh, we are uh, uh, closing at least this chapter, having worked very well together on many important things. Um, uh, it, I, th some, I think it would have been maybe easier not to have served at the same time you at times, but I am, uh, I am very <laughs> certain that um, w many of the initiatives and decisions uh, that we made as collectively would not have been better had that happened. I feel, again, very, very fortunate for that. I think your uh, ability to focus us on the nub of an issue and to 
um, explain things uh, with incredible clarity is something I'm, I'm jealous of and, and uh, will miss. Um, but I think what I'll miss most is uh, your willingness um, to uh, serve in this role, both play that important um, role of listening to your constituents, of knowing what your constituents uh, are saying and, and weighing in, but never failing, never forgetting that a key part of these jobs is to also stay true to your own self and your own judgment, and, and uh, that, that uh, you never lost touch with that, and I appreciate that. Um, uh, Councilor Dean, um, Richard, um, I, uh, I really, uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, the public um, probably well, has a little sense of how valuable the skills, the hard skills you brought to this council are. I think we're going to see an example of that later tonight when we get into some of the discussions about City Hall Park. Having a professional um, uh, of your caliber on this council has been a great opportunity for the city. Um, uh, it doesn't happen that often because it's difficult to combine uh, the life of a professional life and fatherhood with uh, serving, doing what it takes to, to serve in this role. Um, we've been fortunate to have that for, la for the last couple of years. Um, I think, uh, and Councillor Tracy pointed out already, but I think it is very rare to come to this council, especially as a new councillor, and immediately offer the city a new initiative like you have with Burlington Wildways that uh, is going to have, uh, I agree, a, a very lasting impact on this community. I do think in the years to come, this is going to be kind of Burlington's long trail or, or Appalachian Trail, this, this connection of uh, public ways uh, uh, over different land ownerships, uh, connecting these public spaces, I just think is going to have a huge impact on keeping the quality of life in the city outstanding, even, even as we evolve and grow as a city. And uh, in your short time, you, you, you made that happen. Um, I think the thing we'll most miss about you, though, is just your your goodness and your humbleness and your uh, just uh, what uh, the attitude that you bring um, to our interactions. So thank you, Richard. And uh, uh, you know, finally, Dave, um, Councilor Hardnett. Um, you know, I think what I like most about this uh, experience of the last seven years, and I've seen it <clears throat> happen numerous times, is, um, you know, we're, we're a city that loves our, our politics and loves our campaigns and then fights them really hard. And, uh, uh, but what I think maybe isn't fully appreciated by the people that don't sit at this table is once we get through those campaigns, how uh, then we come together and we roll up our sleeves and we... Uh, find ways to get things done for the people of Burlington. I'll never forget after you know, my first election where you and I were in, uh, on opposite sides and the public knew about that. Um, uh, immediately when I stepped into this role, you made it clear uh, that you were going to work with me to, to move the city forward. Um, uh, that is over time built into a real friendship that I'm very grateful for. I'm great, very grateful to have gotten to know Katie and, and Lisa uh, as I have over the last seven years. Um, and I will miss your uh, judgment um, uh, about people. Uh, I will not forget how you impacted so many of our uh, search processes for department heads because you had a great knack for seeing talent and seeing what would, would uh, work, especially uh, with our parks and um, with our schools. Uh, the judgment and commitment you brought there was huge. And, uh, uh, but finally, I, I think what has uh, so set you apart as a counselor is just how in touch with the people in New North End uh, you consistently are. I think all of us like to think that we're in touch with our constituents. You uh, really actively work at that and put huge amounts of time into knowing wh where you're... you're your neighbors are, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm not going to stop uh, stopping by the store in the hope uh, <laughs> I'll uh, find you and be able to get some of that knowledge and know what's uh, really happening on the street, um, and I, I'm sure uh, we'll, we'll stay in touch and look forward to your continued contributions to the city. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Presidential prerogative, I get the last word. Um, and I'm going to cede my time later on to, for a few remarks in, in the end of the agenda to Councilor Nodell. I'll be brief because we need to get down to, to some business here. Um, so, Councilor Dean, um, it's only been two years, but I think your impact on the council was, was tremendous. I thought you were a tremendously thoughtful counselor. Um, I certainly learned from you and will miss you on the city council. 
Um, I know it was a tough, tough uh, campaign, and um, it was tough to keep up with all you're doing in your personal life, with what you were doing on the city council, and keep up with everything. But uh, I thought you did a tremendous job as chair of the license committee, um, and I just I think you will be greatly missed on the city council. So thank you very much, Councilor Dean, for your service to our city. Don't take off, Dave. I thought he was. I thought he was. I thought he was going to pull one of those where he's where he's leaving on me again. I, I thought I was. Gonna, I saw the chair go backward. <laughs> so, Dave and I don't have a complicated relationship. We're longtime friends. We go back 35 years, and um, you know, we. I have times where I have to go to Dave and say, Dave, you know, I think you may have to apologize on that one. <laughs> and, and Dave says, What? What are you talking about? <laughs> but he comes around. He comes around, and and you know, Dave has Dave has a temper. We all know. We've seen it. But he also is a person that cares more than anybody I know. Uh, he cares about his family. He cares about his city. He cares about his friends. And Dave would give you the shirt off of his back. Um, and uh, this council is not going to be the same with Dave Hartnett not on it. So Dave, as a, as a colleague, but more importantly, as a nearly half of my lifetime friend, um, thank you for your incredible eight years on the city council. Uh, I cannot even put into words how much you will be missed. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Nodell, we, we started out dueling back in the early days, in the 90s. Um, I think you were on your second term or third term and I was on my first term and we, we butted heads a lot back then. And, but we, we developed a mutual respect even then and, uh, and the respect grew and grew and so did our, our friendship. Um, now we, I bother Jane on an almost daily basis. Um, I, once in a while, I give her a break and say, Jane, I think you've had enough, so I'm not going to call for a, a couple days here. We've had our moments, too. I remember the famous episode where I, where I told Jane something that she didn't like, and I heard a quick click. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I called her back and said, Jane, after all this, you're hanging up on me? <laughs> but, um, but Jane, you have also been there through thick and thin, and I mean, I, I cannot say how much I appreciate your supporting me when I know that it cost you. And, and that plate that Councillor Shannon gave you, and I think the plates that Councillor Shannon gave, actually, though they cost nothing, I think they are far more uh, value than any plaque that the city could have given you. Um, I think they meant far more. And, and the, the plaque saying um, really hit me, saying, I have a republic, you're my Republican friend, and I'm not afraid to admit it. I, I, I regret that I had you support me, but I, I know that any time that I brought that up, Councillor Nodell said, don't worry about it, it's the right thing to do, and I'm going to do the right thing. I, I think, Councillor Nodell, your, your intellect, your leadership, and, and everything else is really unmatched. When you think about all the issues that we've faced on this city council in all your years here, um, I just cannot even begin to put it into words with you either. Um, your, your loss is going to be an incredible loss for the city, for the city council, and for me personally as a, as a longtime colleague and a longtime friend, and I will miss you. you. And, and actually, one last comment. I remember during the Burlington Telecom debate, I'm sure you'll remember this council, no doubt, because I forgot, I was going to say this, but I forgot. But, you made a, one of your most eloquent speeches, and then you said, I'm not feeling the love. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> Councilor Nodell, I think tonight you have felt the love. Yes, you have. Absolutely. Yep. So, um, so one last time, a, a standing ovation for the three outgoing counselors, and then we'll get down to some business. are back on the agenda now. Um, thank you everybody in the audience for sticking with us through that. 
it's a little bit of a draining few moments here, but um, we are going to, I think we are on to Director Spencer. I think you're up next. Is that right? So there's three scoping study issues here, and um, we talked about this. If you'd start with the, the one that's a little separate from the other two, which is the 4.02, the intervale, correct? Yes, we are going to start uh, with your uh, support, uh, President Wright, quickly on the intervale road scoping study, and then transition to the two related to Colchester Avenue, uh, uh, the intersection and the bridge. Have with me, Senior Transportation Planner Nicole Loesch, who will be giving the overview on the Intervale Road Scoping Study. Thank you, Director Spencer, and thank you, Council, for putting this onto your agenda tonight. I want to start by thanking the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission for their funding and project management support for all of these projects, and for this one, to thank the Intervale Center for their contributions and the community members that came out in support of this tonight. I'll try my slide advancer as well. Um, so this project was uh, really set out to identify ways to enhance access into the intervale and improve the bicycle and pedestrian connections in particular. The study itself identifies the existing conditions, evaluates various alternatives, and engages the community to ultimately select a preferred alternative. The alternatives are based on recommendations in previous planning studies, including our transportation plan, the walk bike plan, and the parks, recreation, and waterfront master plan. And data that's been collected by the Intervale Center over the years shows how important this is. While vehicles are still a primary mode of transportation down there, there is very strong use by people walking, biking, and additional um, trucks that use this for other uses. There is a mix of agricultural, recreational, and industrial uses where, with all of this, pedestrians and bicycles are sharing the road with all the vehicle traffic. The roadway itself, approximately a third of it is paved, the southernmost section, and the remaining section is gravel with a narrower right-of-way. There is one railroad crossing along the asphalt segment, and there were three reported crashes between 2012 and 2016. We involved the community in various ways through the study. We had an advisory committee of city staff, the Regional Planning Commission, the Intervale Center, and Gardner Supply. And we had two community meetings. The last one was an open house at the Intervale Center that uh, helped us really narrow down the preferred alternatives. So the alternatives that we're moving forward with and recommending tonight uh, is alternative three for the asphalt section. And this includes 11 foot travel lanes on the roadway itself with a striped shoulder as well to help vehicles stay in a clear path. A 10 foot shared use path on the west side that includes a three foot buffer for lighting and green space. And the cost estimate for this section is 1.67 million. In the gravel section, they're recommending alternative two. And this is a stone dust path on the eastern side of the roadway. It's outside of a right of way, so this would require strong coordination with the Intervale Center to either install and or maintain this path. And they have participated along the way and are very willing to work with the city as we try to install this stone dust path. The estimate for this section is 230,000. So that's a very quick overview of the study itself. I did provide a link to the website in your packet and on the screen here for anyone that would like more information. Tonight we're asking council to endorse the plan itself and endorse the recommended alternatives so that the city and the Intervale Center can move forward for construction and funding. I'd like to thank the Transportation Energy and Utilities Committee for considering this item and supporting this as well. And with that, I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Nicole. And actually, let's get the resolution on the floor. Uh, Councilor Tracy. So I would move approval of the um, resolution intersection scope, uh, the intersection scoping study of um, a bicycle and pedestrian access feasibility study of Intervale Road um, and waive the reading and adopt the resolution. And after a second, I do not need the floor back. Seconded by Councilor Busher. Um, and Councilor Busher, you do want the floor. Yes, just one. Um, I might have missed it, but with um, the gravel segment, the al alternative two, that's going to be maintained by the Intervale Center, correct? 
They have expressed their willingness to maintain it, yes. Right, right. And that's much less invasive. It's much more environmentally in sync with that section. And so it, it really is quite nice. The whole, the whole process is a really good process. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the city council? Hearing none, Councilor Jang. Yep, and um, it's just a simple question about timeline in starting the project and when do we hope it will be finished? And at the same time, we know the interval during the summer is very busy. If that work will be impacting um, the interval access at all. Thank you. Um, we don't have a construction timeline yet. Um, our, we have a couple of ways of pursuing funding to build this project. Um, one option is we think this will be a very strong candidate for the state's bicycle and pedestrian grant program. And so we will consider that in grant applications. And the other option is uh, trying to fit this in the annual capital program for the city. And so we don't have the funding set aside yet. Um, we would make sure that we would coordinate any construction around the big events in the intervale, the big activities during their busiest months to have um, the least impact that we can. Thank you, Councilor Jang. Any other, Councilor Dean? It's not, uh, thank you, President Wright. It's not a spe specifically a question, but just a comment to say that you know, we've already heard about how valuable the intervale is as, a, as a, one of the, the, the largest open space uh, and center of wildlands in our city. And this makes, as part of uh, the thought about a wild ways connection, this makes that uh, it, it just enhances the ability for us to connect this piece of, of, of critical property to many of the other open lands that exist adjacent to it. So I think it's, it's a, a real positive to see this come forward. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Dean. Any other councillor? Okay, we're ready to vote. All those in favor of approving 4.02, which is the intervale uh, issue, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Now we'll go back to 4.01, and that one is a uh, scoping study of the Main Street slash Winooski River Bridge. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Peter Keating. I'm with the Regional Planning Commission, and we undertook the study in cooperation with the city. I think they came to us a couple of years ago. It's that important link that uh, connects you to your sister city of Winooski. I want to thank the city councilors Busher and Dean who are on the advisory committee for this. They had to sit through about a year and a half worth of meetings. We also have a couple of people who spoke earlier from the Ward 1 MPA, Wayne Sendel and Richard Hilliard, who are also on that committee. I want to thank them for their input as well. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes and some background, but then I want to leap to the recommendations. I think that's the most important part. A trick to this? <laughs> well, could you, you want to use the computer to forward? Amy, if you Amy. can. Yeah. Now, put on this. All right. Thank you. This is the second slide. So, a little bit of background. This is a bridge that goes back to the 27 flood when the previous bridge was washed out. Um, it has gone through some pretty significant repairs in the 60s, 70s, and 90s. Very recently, if you crossed it, you probably would have seen last year the replacing segments of the railing, that, which had deteriorated. Surprisingly, for a bridge that's 90 years old, structurally, structurally it's very sound. Um, unfortunately, it is not the best bridge functionally. Um, the current configuration is this. The lanes are too narrow at 10 and a half feet. There's no shoulder whatsoever. Uh, Sawdewaks aren't up to standard, and the railing is too low. If you're a cyclist, this is a very, very dangerous link. There's no cycling facility at all. If you're on the sidewalk, you're in traffic, and either of those is very, very uh, unsafe. We came up with a number of alternatives, but the two I want to talk about have the same configuration on the top, on the deck. And this is what it is. It essentially widens the entire bridge by about a third. It adds bicycle and pedestrian facilities on both sides, 12-foot shared use paths separated from the lanes. The lanes were expanded to 11 feet. We provide a two-foot shoulder as well. There is a slight difference underneath the bridge between alternatives four and five that we're asking you to make a recommendation on. 
um, and it's related to the abutments and the piers in the river. Alternative four would expand the current abutments and um, piers that are in the river to a cost of $18 million, a little bit more than that. And the other alternative five looks at taking out two of those piers and replacing it with one. This was a suggestion that came from the Agency of Transportation to cut down on the um, obstructions in the river and the um, Agency of Natural Resources folks like this as well to have things out of the, out of the waterway. The cost of this is a little bit higher at 22.7 million. Um, the other part of the recommendation is related to a technique and how this new bridge would be constructed. It's called accelerated bridge construction. I'm going to go through this graphic very quickly to explain how this happens and why it's being recommended as well. This is the current configuration. Those little blue dots you see to the right are the utilities. There's fiber optic cable on this bridge right now. It would have to be relocated. What would happen is the, um, the abutments and the piers would be expanded on the downriver side put in the bike ped facilities on that side, move the utilities over to that newly constructed piece, build a new bridge right next to the current bridge on the upstream side. When that new bridge is ready, close traffic on the existing bridge, take it apart, build the abutments and the piers back to what you need, and slide the new bridge into place. This is a technique that the Agency of Transportation has been using increasingly all around the state. Open up the traffic, get rid of the temporary supports for the old bridge. Um, this is a little tough to see. This is a very, very constrained site. And to make this happen, to build the new bridge that will be slid into place on the upstream side, you've got to get into the river next to the current bridge. That means getting in from both the Winooski side as well as the Burlington side. So when this happens, there will be impacts to um, uh, the Chase Mill parking area as well as the park on the Winooski side. The reason this particular um, method is being recommended is the closure of the bridge. There would be total closure, obviously, when um, they have to take the traffic down and demolish it. It's estimated to take four to six weeks. If this uh, bridge was built by conventional methods, it would take two to three years, replacing one or two lanes at a time as you move across the bridge, keeping some traffic at open, open two or three lanes at a time. Um, so it's difficult for the four to six weeks, it's totally closed. Um, but instead of having restrictions going on for two to three years, it was seen as a, as a better way to move forward. Um, so, similar to the last project, we're asking you to accept the resolution uh, on, on this particular one, to endorse it. If you do that, we'll have to go to the Agency of Transportation to seek funding for this. Right now, it's not on any VTrans uh, bridge list because the condition of the bridge is actually pretty good. We'll have to advocate to move that forward. There may be some alternative funding methods that we can look at, too, in the coming years. Um, but to uh, the question related to when this project might happen that came up earlier, not likely in the very near future. Uh, it's a very complicated uh, project, a very expensive one, taking place in a very, very constrained site. Um, so we'll get back to you on, the, on a schedule when we know better. All right, thank you. Um, Councilor Tracy, to move the resolution? Yep. Whoa. So, uh, sorry. So I... Um, I move approval of the scoping study <laughs> of the Main Street Winooski River Bridge um, and waive the reading and adopt the resolution. Seconded by Councillor Busher. Councillor, uh, and you want the floor back, Councillor Tracy? Yeah, so just one thing that I want to say is that one of the things that we see through these, these scoping studies, thank you, I really appreciate that, I apologize. I, the, through these scoping studies is that we are able to see a tremendous amount of collaboration take place uh, firsthand between our fabulous DPW staff, between partners like the CCRPC, and between adjacent communities like Winooski. And I forgot to mention on the last project between uh, other community partners like the Intervale Center, which was an amazing partner on that, that project as well. So uh, I think that that's one of the most exciting elements of this is that this is uh, not only a, an actual connection, a physical connection, but the process by which we've arrived at it has been through, through a shared collaboration with our adjacent communities and has also been respective of the next item that we're going to talk about, which is an adjacent intersection area. So really trying to take a holistic view, not only of how 
we interact with, with other communities, but how this particular project will re relate to other projects uh, in order to increase safety and access uh, and ultimately connection between uh, surrounding communities. So thank you for all your work on this. Thank you, Councilor Tracy. Discussion by the City Council? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That item passes unanimously. Brings us to item 4.03, which is another scoping resolution uh, on the Colchester Avenue, Riverside Avenue, Barrett Street, Hill Street um, issue. And set us up. Thanks for having me. I'm Jason Shrest with the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. I just want to, uh, when we start these studies, we develop what is called uh, purpose and need statements. And I just want to begin by reading the, the purpose statement just so everyone can get a sense of what the alternatives I'm going to show are trying to achieve. And that was to define a safer intersection that enhances mobility and access for all users while contributing to livable and vibrant communities and ensuring efficient operations. And with our needs we sought to um, address was to improve safety and mobility, simplify the intersection, enhance it as a gateway into Burlington, and manage traffic congestion. Uh, we had several different entities representing our project advisory committee uh, that advised us along the way. Uh, Councillor Busher was on the advisory committee. Thank you for your support <laughs> on this committee. Uh, we also had uh, Wayne Senville and Richard Hilliard, who were previously mentioned, were our Ward um, 1 and 8 NPA representatives. And I forgot to mention it, but I did want to thank our consulting team, Stantec, for their work on this. Um, they were um, asked a lot uh, along the process. I think we originally had three project advisory committee meetings scheduled, and we ended up having a total of five. And a large part of that reason was catering to the request that the advisory committee gave us. There was one short-term alternative that was considered and approved by the committee. There were three medium-term alternatives. Two of them focused around a consolidated signalized intersection. They were just variations on each other. And the third one was a roundabout. Uh, the roundabout was discarded a little bit um, before the end of the process. It's just not being viable. Um, so the main decision centered around the two, um, the signalized intersection variation. And the advisory committee landed on um, preferring alternative one, which I will show a graphic of momentarily. Uh, there was also a uh, hybrid alternative that could sort of serve as a stepping stone if the medium term alternative was taking too long to get to. There's the option of at, uh, adding an additional northbound uh, through lane uh, coming down the hill on Colchester Avenue going across the bridge into Winooski to kind of uh, mitigate the extensive queuing that happens uh, up the hill. And when I say short term, that was envisioned to happen within a three year time frame, and medium term was within a three to 10 year uh, time window. But a large part of that will depend on the availability of achieving funding to construct these. And last on this slide, but not least, this study was actually delayed uh, quite a bit. We started in early 2017, I want to say January of 2017. And it was actually put on hold because the Winooski Bridge study started maybe about a year after. So we kind of waited for that to catch up just to make sure that uh, the two of them would align appropriately. And the main consideration there was we were unsure of how many lanes on the bridge were being recommended. So once they were confident um, with that study that there was going to be four lanes, we, we picked this back up and moved it forward. So up on the screen right now is the short-term alternative. It, north is up, just to orient you. Um, Riverside Ave and Colchester Ave kind of come in from the south. You'll see uh, Barrett Street and Mill Streets coming in from the east. And it largely looks like it does today, but there's um, some significant um, enhancements in terms of bicycle and pedestrian movement uh, throughout the intersection. Um, 
enhanced crosswalks and bicycle markings through the intersections. <coughs> um, pedestrian signals are called for here, which have actually um, been installed by DPW, so part of this is, is complete. Uh, it calls for a new crosswalk across the bridge, which is at the top here, which doesn't exist today. It calls for a sidewalk along Mill Street. Uh, there's a, a little bit of um, unconventional parking that happens on this side of the intersection, so that's been formalized. And we've also called for adding in a protected uh, left turn to go into Barrett Street. It's a difficult movement right now, so that would actually give uh, a vehicle a dedicated green arrow uh, to make that movement and then also some um, better signage for people um, coming up Riverside Avenue. And here is uh, alternative one, the four-way intersection, and that would consolidate things to a signalized intersection at the intersection of Riverside and Barrett Street, which is right here, and it would turn Mill Street into a stop-controlled intersection uh, it's um, <coughs> advised that we uh, examine an, an, a possible right turn only coming out of that intersection, but that's a detail that'll be flushed out further as this goes into design. Um, get some more bicycle um, enhancements. This actually removes the on-street parking between Barrett and Mill Street. And we have eliminated this area right here. It's the, probably the most significant aesthetic-wise um, that would create the opportunity for a pocket park and would um, decrease the amount of pavement in the area. Uh, the cost of this is about $3.3 million, and this is the alternative that the Project Advisory Committee and the Transportation, Energy, and Utilities Committee um, are recommending um, for endorsement as the municipally preferred alternative. And next steps, I think there's a resolution um, in front of you for those two alternatives that I just uh, went over. And just a note that, again that the short-term implementation, implementation has begun. And I'll take any questions. All right, thank you. Uh, let's first get the resolution on the floor. Councillor Tracy. I move that we waive the reading and adopt the resolution uh, regarding the intersection scoping study of Colchester Avenue, Riverside Avenue, Barrett Street, uh, and Mill Street. Thank you, Councillor Tracy. Seconded by Councillor Dean. Uh, Councillor Tracy, do you need the floor back? Thank you. Councillor Busher. So um, I, I will say that um, this was not as easy. Um, this was challenging. and. We did come together with alternative one, but it, you did reference one of the issues that still needs some further discussion. Mill Street is this little street in Ward 1 that has a lot of activity now. There's some new businesses, there is a restaurant, and it's been revitalized. It's very small, I understand that, but if you start restricting traffic and only have it go one way or right turn only, um, that was not something that everyone that interacts on Mill Street either lives or has to do business there was absolutely supportive of. So I think that really does need a second look. Other than that, I think that we did come together and I think the process, it's a healthy process. It was a very diverse group of people and we all got our, our thoughts out there on the table and it was amazing that we came up with something that we all could support. So anyway, thank you for your efforts on this. Thank you, Councillor Busher. Anyone else? Hearing Councillor Jang. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I just wanted to double check as to why we haven't seen UVM as part of the study here. Looks like there were a lot of organizations, but the not UVM knowing that Colchester Avenue cuts through UVM. We did have a representative on the project advisory committee that was speaking on behalf of the Hill Institution, so UVM, UVM Medical Center, and Champlain College. Um, and also in terms of cost, looks like the first presentation around the bridge did mention the agency of transportation in terms of cost. But here, where the cost will be coming from? 
that will remain to be seen. Um, there is the possibility, though, that this could go after some safety funding. That funding is, is limited. That's actually how the uh, roundabout in the south end is being funded. Um, so that's a potential opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jang. Any other councillor? Hearing none, all those in favor of item 4.03, the intersection scoping study of Colchester Ave, Riverside Ave, Barrett Street, and Hill Street, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, real quickly, before we move on to item 4.04, .04, we are going to adjourn the city council meeting. Don't worry, just for a minute. And we are going to, not adjourn, excuse me, <laughs> not adjourn, recess. not adjourn. We're going to recess briefly the city council meeting so that I can convene the Liquor Control Commission meeting. Um, item number one is the agenda, Commissioner Dean. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. I would move uh, that we adopt our agenda. Oh, seconded by Council Roof. All those in favor of adopting the agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have the agenda. Item number two, Commissioner Dean. Um, I would move the uh, adoption of the consent agenda, taking the actions as indicated. Council, that is seconded by Councilor Roof. All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have passed the consent agenda. Um, now on to the deliberative agenda and item 3.01, Commissioner Dean. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. I move the approval of the 2018-2019 First Class Restaurant Bar Liquor License Application for La Boca Wood-Fired Pizzeria with the following conditions, contingent upon fire marshal approval with all standard conditions. Second. Seconded by Councilor Roof. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Item number 3.02, Commissioner Dean. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. I move the approval of the 2018-2019 First Class Restaurant, bar, liquor license application for Paisano's 176 Main Street with the following conditions, contingent upon fire marshal approval with all standard conditions. Second. Seconded by Councilor Roof. Discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 3.02 passes and 3.03, .03. Commissioner you. Dean. Commissioner Wright, I'd move the approval of the 2018-2019 Second class store liquor license application for Nepali Dumpling House, 78 North Street, with the following conditions contingent upon fire marshal approval with all standard conditions. Second. Seconded by Councilor Roof. Any discussion? Councilor Jang? I have a question um, and a quick question. And if you can make the distinction between um, first class and second class, what are the differences, please? So a, a first class uh, liquor license allows uh, those people who hold that license to serve liquor on the premises um, and requires them to then monitor how um, the people who, who are running that, that uh, business to monitor how that's uh, and comply with DLC uh, re restrictions on how it's served. A second class license is for uh, sales of, of liquor in a store environment. So it's essentially as a store. Um, and those are, are two uh, understood as by the DLC as two different types of, of licensing requirements. Thank you, Councilor Dean. Thank you, Councilor Jang. Any further discussion on this item? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And we have passed item 3.03. .03. Motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn by Commissioner Dean, seconded by Commissioner Roof. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have adjourned the Liquor Control Commission meeting. And again, Thank you, Commissioner Dean, for your great work as chair of that committee. You have you, big shoes Wright. to fill. Thank you. We will have big shoes. Um, and now, I, with that meeting recessed, I am going to convene the Board of Civil Authority meeting. Um, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, <clears throat> President Wright. I'd like to convene the Board of Civil Authority at uh, 9.49 p.m. And first item on the agenda is the agenda. I'd welcome a motion for it. Move approval. Thank you, President Wright. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Jang. Discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Motion carries uh, unanimously. And that brings us to the consent agenda. Move approval of the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. Is there a second? Thank you, Councillor Dean. Discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And uh, at 9.50 p.m. President Wright, the Board of Civil Authority is adjourned.
All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Now we will reconvene the regular meeting of the City Council at the same time, 9.50, and item 4.04, .04, a communication from Mayor Weinberger regarding appointment of Human Resource Director. Mr. Mayor. Great, thank you, President Wright. Um, I would like to um, invite uh, Deanna Palumbo to join us here at the table, and uh, uh, um, Deanna Paluba, ha we are, so he here's the thing, you know, the city of Burlington, um, like most organizations, the most important asset that the city has is in many ways its, its people, its, its employees, and the stewardship, the care of the employees, um, the nurturing of our employees falls to the human uh, relations uh, department to um, uh, to the Human Resources Department to uh, take care of, and um, I am excited that after an extensive national search, uh, to be bringing Deanna um, to you for uh, uh, appointment as the new Director uh, of Human Resources tonight. Let me just say a few things about Deanna's um, background and why I think she's such a strong candidate. Um, she has been uh, had an extensive uh, career working with employees in a variety of roles. Uh, she had a long um, run at IBM um, and uh, where she uh, got rave reviews from her colleagues there. And then um, after um, uh, she, she moved to the West Coast and became involved with a biotech company out there called Gilead Sciences. Um, and while she was the um, head of employee relations. That company grew from 4,000 employees to 10,000. Um, and uh, Deanna, throughout that period, headed up an international team uh, that um, uh, helped the, the company manage that successful growth. She, uh, so in addition to her excellent background, she has deep roots in this community. She grew up in Colchester. She uh, has um, received a, a couple of degrees from Champlain College. Um, and finally, uh, throughout her professional career, particularly at Gilead, she has demonstrated her commitment to diversity and inclusion. Gilead was recognized by Forbes, Forbes magazine as a best employer for diversity uh, during her time uh, at the company and after she had pushed for inclusion as one of the core uh, values of, 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 of the company. So um, for those reasons and more, President Wright, I am excited to uh, be presenting um, Deanna, uh, to you for, for confirmation tonight. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any, uh, <coughs> Councilor Shannon, I'll recognize you for a motion and then if we have questions for the candidate. Uh, I move to approve the mayor's appointment of Deanna Paluba as the city's director of human resources and grant the, uh, personal hardship waiver for residency. Okay, Councilor, thank you, Councilor Shannon, seconded by Councilor Dean. All right, it's on the floor, discussion. Councilor Jang. Um, welcome, and thank you. thank you for joining the city. And my question is maybe to, yes, Councilor Shannon, around the hardship. Um, is it undetermined? or do we have a specific time for the hardship for her, for uh, the new employee to relocate here in, uh, in Burlington? Councilor Shannon. Um, I'm sorry, uh, could you repeat the question? What, what was the question? Yeah, the question was about the hardship. Yes. Yes, so I was asking if there is a specific time that we grant the hardship or it's just undetermined? Oh, I think that's probably better for the city attorney. Yes. Uh, I believe under the 2016 changes that you folks made to the rule, it is if they were to change their residency in terms of sell the home, then it becomes, uh, it would come back to this body. But there's not a time limit upon this subsection. Okay, but can we make one? Can we propose a specific time? Um, not in the rules that this body passed. <laughs> Interesting. <coughs> uh, 
I'm not sure. It's not in the rules. It's not in the rules. All right. But now, Council President, it's not in the rule to determine a certain time for the hardship. But how can we ensure that we have one? Like maybe two years, three years. How can we ensure that we will approve that aspect? Well, the mayor, I think, would want to speak to that. But we have we passed uh, an item on this where we we changed. Actually, we have an exemption uh, that would seem to fit this one pretty neatly, Mr. Mayor. That's right, President. I just want to point out the the. Um, the the essence of what Councillor Shannon has moved is that uh, all, it is clear within the, the way the charter is written, a new appointee has up to a year to become a voter of the city of Burlington. The council has the authority um, under certain conditions to grant um, uh, an extension, an indefinite extension of that. That's what Councillor Shannon has proposed. Um, the council has defined the reasons uh, by which these extensions will be granted. There are three of them, um, and we are proposing that Deanna uh, be granted the extension out of the third one, the one most recently created, which has been given to four other department head directors, which is that because she uh, owns already um, a house in a nearby community within Chittenden County, her house happens to be about a mile from the city border and one that her family has um, occupied for generations, uh, decades, um, that it would constitute a, uh, a hardship to require her to sell uh, this uh, long family position um, uh, for, uh, uh, for what amounts tonight to a three-month appointment and, and what will you know, ultimately be uh, uh, you know, no longer than a two-year appointment. Um, my, my view on it is we have granted this uh, exemption to, again, four other employees. I think it would be a mistake um, and very hard to define why we would do that for um, uh, our other department heads and not do that for Deanna. I think it would be a major mistake uh, to do that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All set, Councillor Chang? Um, not really, not, not really all set, but I just wanted to make sure that we all have an agreement that maybe we will give um, Tiana like a year at least in order for her to figure out ways to become a registered voter of the city of Burlington. I mean, I just wanted well, to bring important. that um, aspect into it. Uh, okay, and that's not what the motion is. The motion is that we're granting her the exemption so she does not have to come back after a year. So then it's up to any counselor if they choose to, to not support this. Um, okay, now, but now we have counselor Tracy in line and then Councillor Mason and Councillor Hartnett. So thank you so much for being here tonight and for um, applying for this job. Um, I'm very much impressed by your qualifications uh, and I think that um, you're going to do great work for the city of Burlington should you be approved tonight um, and I hope that I have reason to work with you um, in that role should you get it. Um, you may know this about me but I've been very consistent on the residency requirement. Um, I've voted against pretty much everybody, every department head that's been, actually not pretty much, every department head that has been brought uh, forward who has not lived in Burlington. I just have this thing that I think that the department heads um, who are part of the city uh, should live in the city of Burlington. Um, I know that others have moved to Burlington and, or have, have relocated to this area and have made the specific choice to move to Burlington. And so um, purely out of fairness to the and, and out of consistency to those uh, other department heads um, who I've either voted against or who have relocated, um, I will not be supporting um, your appointment tonight, but it's not a, a comment on your character um, or your, um, your, uh, your qualifications for the role, and I just want to be very clear about that because this is a matter of consistency and a matter of really feeling that we should have our department heads live in Burlington, but Th thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tracy. Councillor Mason? Thank you, President Wright. Um, thank you for coming. I'm like others, I'm most impressed by your resume and look forward to working with you. Fine. I do, however, have some of the same monies that I think we're hearing, and I think that flows out of the 2016 exemption um, that we adopted, and I, I think it's worth this council potentially referring to charter change to sort of dig into a little, because my concern is this is drafted now, which I think Ms. Palua has met, all it requires is a certification of hardship, and we're somewhat bound by that. As it's been applied, it's sort of been because of, you know, with various candidates, you know, the statement that if I moved, I would lose money. 
uh, my concern is, you know, that exemption is somewhat consuming the whole. I don't know anyone that would not meet that criteria. If it's just moving causes a financial hardship, everyone would meet that criteria. So I hope to work with maybe Council Tracy and some others to come up with a resolution for the next council to, to maybe look a little closer at that and put some greater certainty around that to avoid this uncomfortable conversation every time someone doesn't live in Burlington. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Mason. Okay, are we, Councillor, no, he's all set. Councillor Pine? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, Mr. President, I wondered if the, um, there are a couple of department heads that I believe are not subject to the uh, residency requirement now, and I'm just, it occurred to me that this one may be one for future consideration in that regard. So when we talk about, you know, future changes, I'm not sure the HR director is, um, you know, is one that needs to be on that same list because there are other department heads that we have made that exception for it permanently. Right. Thank you. Okay. That. Appreciate that. Okay. Councilor Paul. Thank you. Um, so I was, I had the pleasure of uh, uh, spending some time with Deanna and I was really glad to be able to be at the press conference. Um, your resume speaks for itself um, and uh, your qualifications, you're very qualified for the job and I think I, I think it's our job to support you and see that you're successful. Um, uh, I have also, like uh, Councillor Tracy and Councillor uh, Mason, have, have always supported that um, department heads should live in the city of Burlington. But, you know, we, we did make an accept, we did make another um, uh, uh, um, exception and change to that policy um, by allowing that if people, lived in Chittenden County um, at the time that they um, were appointed, that they did not have to move. And um, that's one of the, you know, just like being promoted from within and having children in another school district. So again, I, you know, I, it wasn't something that I was particularly supportive, but it is a rule. And, um, you know, whether you win or lose, it's the, it's, it certainly is one of the things that um, uh, it, it, is, it is an exemption. And so um, because of that, I'm happy to support you and will do everything that I can, as I'm sure everyone else, whether they vote for you or not, um, will do what they can uh, to see that you're successful. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Any other discussion by the City Council? Hearing none, all those in favor of the appointment, please. Oh, would you like, did you want to say a few words? Yeah, just, I just want to tell, say that I'm really excited and honored to have this opportunity to be considered, to be part of the, to the City of Burlington team and the HR department. Um, I am, you know, really tied to this community. I understand your, your positions and respect that for sure. Uh, but I live right in Colchester and I live in my family home. Um, I have two adult children that live in California and I'm hoping to entice them to move back to Vermont by, you know, selling um, my home to them someday when they return, so I'm not opposed to moving to Burlington someday, but it's not something I'm able to do now. Um, you know, I have a long history. I've been working in HR for about 16 years, and I, some of the areas of, uh, that I'm passionate about that I hope to bring to the city of Burlington is uh, my, my desire to really focus on employee engagement, because that's how we get important things done. Um, my, um, my focus on... Um, on making sure that we have equitable and fair employment policies within the within the organization which I work for, and and finally, you know, I've really got a history of being focused on diversi diversity and inclusion, and I think that's something that's also important to the to the uh, to the mayor and to the city of Burlington as well. So <clears throat> I um, I really just asked uh, thank you for your consideration, and I'm really excited um, and hope that you will support me in this. Thank thank you, Ms. Palumba. I think we are ready to vote. Great. All those in favor of this appointment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. One no vote, Councillor Tracy. Okay. So that you're, you are approved, congratulations. Congratulations, thank you. Item number 4.05 is a communication from the mayor regarding the appointment of Brian Lowe as Chief Innovation Officer. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, President Wright. Um, 
so to make sure we're all on the same page about what's happening here, you may recall a year ago, um, uh, Brian Lowe, who has served in important roles for the city, two, two prior important roles in the mayor's office, um, uh, we came forward and asked you to make him the interim uh, uh, <coughs> chief innovation officer. Um, and the reason for asking him to be appointed as an interim, um, th there was no doubt about how committed Brian was or his hardworking nature how, uh, or um, just his all around uh, great collegiality and, and great person to have on the team. There, there was a question stepping into this very different role than the prior ones, whether it would be a great fit for him and whether it would be a great fit for the city. Um, I'm very happy to be coming back here, not surprised, but still very happy to be coming back a year later um, when in this role, Brian has had an incredible, I believe, record of achievement over the last year. He has led the effort that, that resulted in voter approval to um, create, bring about perhaps the most significant reorganization of city government in a couple decades with the permit reform effort. He has stood up the early learning initiative, first the capacity grant um, effort, and now, as you know, we are out in the community um, with the beginning of these first step scholarships, something that wouldn't have happened without years of effort on, on Brian's part. He uh, shepherded um, with the support of uh, with others, but he was on point for the equity report that I think was an important addition to our annual town meeting day reporting this year. And he um, has uh, totally and quite eff seemingly effortlessly, the, the rest of us uh, brought about a wonderful, you know, really a very substantial redesign of, of the website, making it a far more user uh, friendly interface. And I, I, you know, there's a lot of less visible stuff on the technology side that Brian has also been responsible for and succeeded at, at overseeing and, and ushering in. So um, it is with uh, great enthusiasm that I come back to you and ask for Brian's. Um, interim role to be um, made permanent, and um, I hope he'll have strong council support uh, in that tonight. All right. Uh, Mr. Lowe, did and you we're want not to seeking a residency exemption. <laughs> no residency exemption. All right. <laughs> I, know, then residency. I know exactly where he lives. Um, all right. A couple words, Mr. Lowe, before we see if there's anything from the council. Uh, just, just very briefly, it, it really has been a great privilege to serve in this role. I'm grateful to the mayor for the opportunity. Um, and. Those are very kind words, but there's definitely a, a big team working on a number of these different projects that um, in, in the INT department and then across the city. Thank you, Mr. Lowe. Any questions from the council? Council Hartnett. Thank you. I don't have any questions. I just have a comment, and so I'm glad we're actually doing this tonight. Um, I, because I remember a year ago when we did this, right, and everybody was kind of a little uncertain for different reasons, right, and and I was really glad that the city was out thinking outside the box here, right? That we were going to give somebody that had, uh, you know, worked hard for the city an opportunity to prove himself and to show us, you know, what he had. We didn't really go for the national search and we, we didn't do this. We said to somebody, look, you've been good to Burlington. You've worked hard for us. You've done a lot of great things. You'd like to try this opportunity. You know, you're going to work close with Beth Anderson. You're going to do, you know, all this stuff. And, um, and I know that felt it gave some counselors a little uncomfortable feeling. I was excited that we were doing that. I, I think that says a lot as a city, that we're willing to take care of one of our own that worked hard and give him the opportunity to, to see if he could succeed, right? That we were gonna give him that challenge. He was gonna accept the challenge and take it. And, and, and it, he has done so in just a remarkable way. And, but I applaud the city for taking that approach. I think it's important that we do that. We don't have to do it every single time, but we have to do it once in a while. And this was a great case to do it in, and we've, we've, been, we've been rewarded with it. And I just would like to acknowledge all the work that he has done on the early initiative learning. It's been amazing. I've been proud to work with him on that. We spoke earlier tonight. Um, it's just, it, I, I, I welcome this, and it's a great, great appointment tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Hartnett. I think we'd all agree that Brian's done a great job for the city. Any other discussion by the city council? Hearing none, yep. Councilor Jang. Um, sorry, President, but I have to say something about this wonderful guy because he's an incredible person. And many people don't know he's a soldier as well. He is a member of the military, a father, and also a resident of my ward. When I came here, and I was new, I'm still new here, not even two years yet, but he was the first person who really showed me real integrity 
and real hard work how it looked like. And I think it all came out during the uh, middle, you know, and I looked at him all the time and hope that when I become mayor someday, you'll work for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Jang. That's not tonight, though. Okay, so all those in favor of this nomination, please say. I have uh, to make a motion. Uh, no, the appointment has not been moved. Councillor Shannon. I move to confirm the appointment of Brian Lowe as Chief Innovation Officer. Seconded by Councillor Roof. All those in favor of the appointment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations. <coughs> Thank you. A lot of standing O's tonight. Item 4.55, item, item we have to keep moving here, folks. Item 4.55 was 3.52 on the consent agenda. Councillor Nodell. Yes, President Wright, this is item 4.055, which was 3.52 on consent. I move adoption of this resolution, making a, approving a fourth amendment to the lease agreement with the Leahy Center for Lake Champlain. Briefly have request the floor after second. Seconded by Councillor Roof. Councillor Nodell, you have the floor back. Thank you, President Wright. Um, this, the city has a lease agreement with the Leahy Center for Lake Champlain, also known as ECHO. Um, this, is, we, this is a longstanding lease. This is the fourth amendment that we propose making tonight. Um, it comes to the council on a three to one vote at the Board of Finance, which is why it was pulled off of consent. Um, the issue that came up at the Board of Finance meeting relates to the fact that um, this change in the lease will acknowledges a change in the governance of the Leahy Center that has been in place for over 10 years, but which is at odds with the change in the bylaws of the Leahy Center is at odds with what the lease has said these many years. And so we are bringing the lease into conformity with the bylaws. Um, my view was I didn't love the process, but we, the city has many ways of ensuring accountability of the Leahy Center to the city. Um, and based on that and the fact that they've been functioning well and that there was a discussion with the university president and with the mayor when they made this change in board composition. Um, I was comfortable with it, and um, I urge support of this motion. Thank you, Councillor Nodell. Councillor Busher. So I was the no vote, um, and I just wanted to explain. Um, so I, I so value the, the um, echo. Um, but what the original lease said was that there would be, the board of directors would be comprised of one third of the representatives coming from the city of Burlington, one third from the University of Vermont, and one third to be representatives of the public at large. And the communication that we were given, as, as Councillor Nodell stated, was that um, in 2008, there was a, a drift from this, um, and uh, there was a decision uh, from by their bylaws to no longer adhere to that. To me, that's disturbing. That, um, but I, but what I didn't know was what I learned was that that was shared with the president of UVM, as Councilor Nodell stated, and the mayor at that time. Um, and I understand that this brings us into compliance with their bylaws. But I feel that ECHO is on the waterfront. I feel that it's really important that there be some members. It doesn't have to be the ratio that's stated in the original um, lease. But I really felt that there should be representation from one or two members from Burlington. Um, I understand that there are, they have a very close working relationship with Parks and Rec. And, um, but I still feel pretty strongly that 
as we move forward in the future, you have to take the people out of the equation and just talk about structure. I think it would be a better structure for Burlington if we had representatives from Burlington on that board. And that's why I didn't support this. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilor Busher. Any other discussion on this issue? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. no. Two no votes. The two no votes are Councilor Busher and Councilor Tracy. That passes by a 10 to two vote. Uh, we are now on to item 4.06, and a request has been made that we have a recess, a, a really, really short recess. Uh, so we will recess for two minutes. We'll literally back, be back in two minutes. Okay. We are back. All right, item 4.0, are you ready, Councilor Nodell? 4.06, Councilor Nodell. Thank you, President Wright. I move adoption of the, I waive the, move to, I waive the reading, and move adoption of the resolution relating to authorization to execute contract for the reconstruction of City Hall Park and ask for the floor after a second. Second by Councilor Hartnett. Councilor Nodell, you have the floor. Thank you. The, the version of this resolution that I moved is the one that was posted to board docs at the end of the week, last week. Um, so and I wanted to, to note that the whereas clause starting on line 81 is not strictly correct, but the, the, the amendment that will be coming from Councilor Pine if it, if it succeeds, will correct the small inaccuracy there about the exact action taken by the Board of Finance. If that motion to amend fails, um, we'll be re we, we should just correct that, that language about the Board of Finance action. So this vote tonight is, a, is to approve a construction contract. This is not a vote on the design of City Hall Park. The design of the City Hall Park renovation has gone through many, many meetings at different levels of our community. And last June, the council, after the ad hoc committee did its work, and after the development review board granted a permit a board of citizens appointed by this body to act on behalf of the people of Burlington granted a permit. We then came to the council, had listened to the community about concerns about the trees. We created the ad hoc committee process. It resulted in the restoration and adding of additional trees. And then in June, this council said yes to a revised design. And based on that action, the city went out and put this project to bid. The bids came back in February, and we had, they, they came back higher than very rough estimates of cost that we asked for in January in order to be transparent with the public about the sources and uses of funds for this project based on what we knew at the time. Now, the bids came back higher and we have a very good memo from staff explaining why. And we may hear more from them if we want to hear more, but the memo is there for everyone to read. And I think it's important for this council to understand that some of the reason for the increased cost is on us is on the city council that said we need an ad, we want to do an ad hoc committee, we want to take more time, we're going to make changes, and when you make changes, you then have to pay more money to the people who do the design and do the engineering, and so we have to own some of that higher cost, 
and the delay in the bidding meant that we are in an environment where there's many more con construction projects going on in the city of Burlington. And so we're, on, we're not in a great bar bargaining position when there's a lot of work out there. And so we have to acknowledge that we own some of these increased costs. Now, many of us have been communicating with the mayor about the costs coming in higher than we thought they would be based on the January 2019 estimates. And as a result of that fact, and I think a sharing of concerns about that, because we do have to acknowledge that we have budget constraints. We have many, many good things that we are trying to do in the city of Burlington on limited resources. And so we should try to trim the cost as much as possible. Um, and I'm going to end there in order to um, anticipate the, I think the, what is coming up as the, as the First Amendment. It is true that this value engineering and efforts to reduce the cost, that work has continued through today. Um, and this is how, this is how um, the, when we work together between the council and administration, we often work up until the end in order to try to make the best decision possible. Um, and so I hope that we'll have, be able to walk through some of the ways in which the, this budget has been trimmed. Um, and I will uh, end my comments there and reserve the right to maybe speak briefly to the amendment, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Nodell. Um, I think that I want to go to the in order of uh, the amendment. I want to get right into the amendments. Do we need to hear from the team for a minute first? That's okay. entirely up to you. Okay, then I, I want to go because really the crux of this debate is going to be the amendments, quite honestly. So I want to go to the. In, I'm going to go to Councillor Dean for the first, that's listed as the First Amendment, and Councillor Dean. Thank you, President Wright. Um, shall I read the text of the amendment first? Yes. Um, and, and one thing that's not uh, included in the information that's been provided to the Council is where this would be inserted. Right. I'm proposing that it goes after line 57 in the current resolution language. So. Um, Here's how the, the text of the amendment proposed. Whereas the Department of Public Works, who have been managing the City Hall Park bidding process in partnership with the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Waterfront, advises the Council that the date for acceptance of the initial bid provided on February 11th by the low bidder, SD Ireland, legally, legally expires on or around March 30th, 2019 and therefore requires that the Council take action at its March 25th meeting or risk losing the commitment of the low bidder, SD Ireland, to move forward with a project during the, two, the 2019 construction season at the current bid pricing. So after okay. a second, I would... Seconded by Councillor Hartnett. You have the floor back, Councillor Dean. Right. So, the intent here is to, to, I think there have been questions tonight about why it is important for the council to act tonight on this issue. Um, I think this frames the, the kind of, uh, if, if we wish to move forward with this uh, remake and, and, and re-envisioning of City Hall Park, we have to make a decision in the short term. We cannot take additional time because it essentially negates the fact that we have a low bid in, uh, in place that has a time sensitive, uh, uh, a decision has to be made and it's a time sensitive decision. So that's, that's why I'm offering this amendment as a point of clarification to the resolution um, and uh, ask for uh, people's consideration of, of that as, a, as, as just a point of information more than anything else. Thank you, Councillor Dean. Is there any discussion on this amendment? Councillor Busher? Um. So I just have a question. Was um, did did the administration actually ask SD Ireland if indeed they would change their bid if it ex went beyond March 30th? Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, the team's been in you know very frequent communication with SD Ireland in recent weeks, and it's clear they're under considerable pressure to fill their dance card and. Uh, the way the <clears throat> amendment um, gets it exactly right. We cannot 
there's great risk that we will leave, lose them as a low bidder if uh, we do not come to a uh, decision on this. Uh, so they no. said they would raise the bid or no? I, that's my question. <clears throat> yeah, they said they are under pressure and, it is, and we cannot guarantee that we can hold them to the bid if we do not make a decision. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Busher. Councillor Tracy? I'm not going to support the amendment because I think that uh, we should uh, go back to the drawing board and try to come up with a design that cuts costs more significantly and therefore would have a lower bid than the lowest bid currently. So I will not be supporting this uh, amendment um, to the resolution. Thank you, Councillor Tracy. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. The two no votes are Councillor Busher and Councillor Tracy. So that passes by a vote of 10 to 2. The second amendment is Councillor Jangs. Thank you, um, Council President, and thank you for being here. And I think this community, again, need to definitely have something very tangible for us to move forward. My amendment is going to speak to the hard work that the administration been doing behind the scene. Almost nearly one third of the total cost of the park has been raised. We received one million donation, another 500,000 donation, and then another 28,000. And I feel like this administration would wanna do the work in making sure that taxpayers won't really feel the effect of the cost. And I think Jane O'Dell did have a very good point. If the cost is here, it's because of the delays that we've been doing for over years. Burlington is not the Burlington of the 800. Burlington is now in the 21st century, and we need to stay competitive. I have always loved the plan, and I don't want to see more money from the taxpayers going to the, um, going to the park. To me, that's a fiscal responsibility in making sure that residents here are not putting much pennies into the park. And my amendments, and I would like it to be the second resolve clause after uh, line 94, I do believe, depending on what resolution we're talking about. Um. Okay, we've, we've got it as a second resolve clause, Councillor Jang. Okay. Yep, and it says, be it further resolved, that the city council urges the administration to make good faith efforts to secure further philanthropic donations to City Hall Park before the end of the project to reduce property taxes as reflected by the CIP annual bound and penny for park categories on the budget, being used to pay for the project from the budget of 1.25 million to less than 1 million. And for the administration to provide regular updates to the Board of Finance. I think this is a way for us to keep on searching further and further uh, resources from those who have, and we should be very proud to live in a city where public and private can meet to get things done. Um, thank you, and hope that you will support the amendment. Thank you, Councillor Jang. Uh, any discussion uh, from the City Council? Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Pine. Any discussion from the Council? <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. <coughs> and that language is inserted in the second clause. And we are on to the next amendment, which is Councillor Pine. Point of order, Councillor. Right. Councilor order, Ryan. point of order, Councilor Mason, what is your point of order? The hour is late, and I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules to allow us to complete our agenda. Councilor Mason has moved that we suspend our rules, complete our agenda. It requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Councilor Mason. We've passed the suspension of our rules, and we'll continue to complete the agenda. Councilor Pine. Mr. President, um, since we're going to go through some line-by-line -line amendments. Um, I really feel that the full council and the public, both here tonight and the viewing public, 
would benefit from hearing from staff about what changes have been made, because a lot of comments were made earlier in public forum um, that indicated people are, are wondering how we got to this number. So can we do that now? Let's get right into it. You have the floor to explain, I think, basically what you told us at the Board of Finance. Go ahead, yeah. Laura. No, we're, we have um, a display. So I'm Laura Wheelock, DPW, for those who aren't familiar, Norm Baldwin and Nina from our Parks, Recreation, and Waterfront. Make um, sure you pull the microphone in, speak clearly into it so we can all hear you. Um, so yes, we've done a lot of work in the last uh, few weeks after receiving the bids from SD Ireland to try to find ways to bring the park back within the budget that was presented to you and within the revenue sources that we uh, could afford for it. Uh, as Councillor Nodell mentioned earlier, there was several factors why we believe that our bid price came in higher than anticipated, um, listed in the memo that was submitted to the Council, things like the contaminated soils that were not known previously. Um, to have a value number, we are still learning more information as we go through the uh, corrective action plan with the state. Uh, so that is still open-ended. The tree management plan, as we discussed with both bidders who submitted on this project, indicated that the means and methods, the labor hours that are going to be needed to be able to preserve the trees that are in the park um, has certainly impact, impacted the costs that were received. Um, there's also just the timeline that we're on for bidding. We are in the end of what is usually the competitive season. Most contractors have their work for this summer lined up before February. And as mentioned, SD Ireland, their card is full. They don't actually need this work. <coughs> they are taking it because they do do a lot of projects for the city and are honoring their bid until we complete our process tonight. Um, the other uh, factor that's come into play, which you will see with some of our other projects um, that we have asked for approval for and will be coming forward with, Material costs are just higher this year. Um, paving bids, sidewalk bids, City Hall Parks bid, um, our water work, it's all coming in higher than estimated. This is due to contractor availability and the numerous projects that are out there for work to be done. Um, brought up on the screen um, is the value engineering that has gone into both the memo as well as the uh, amendment that I believe is coming forward tonight. Before we leave our, um, or the motion coming forward tonight, before we leave the memo, I do wanna note that um, the Parks Department, as part of this value engineering, is taking on the landscape plantings within the park, the trees, and our stormwater gardens, as well as removal of the existing trees. Um, and finally, if we do look at the fact that if this project does not go forward tonight, I want to recognize that there are still significant costs that need to go into the project. It was asked at the Board of Finance and we did a little bit of math um, in between to look at the money that if it was not allocated towards this park tonight that would be available for other city uses. It's in the magnitude of $820,000 is the only city money that can be dedicated to other resources besides this park. And of that, there needs to be about 500 to remediate the soils out there. So it's not a lot of money if the park doesn't go forward tonight. So with that, <laughs> I do want to go forward and talk about the value engineering items that are in front of you. There is a map that corresponds to these items um, if you need to look at them graphically. The number at the top of the page is the base bid for SD Island as it was received. This again does include the value engineering of having parks do all of the plantings and procurement uh, for that work next spring. There are two additives into that cost. One was gonna be needed regardless. It's the $30,000 for the fence. This goes around the HVAC equipment and the new electrical equipment. This was just done to give us alternatives um, for the different finish of that fence. There's also an elective add to finish the park's grass with sod instead of a seed. Uh, this will create a more finished product when the contractor finishes next year. Included in your memo are the items that are in the first table to quickly go down the, through these. Um, it's changing one of the tree protection items uh, that Parks agreed to. There is a change of a granite drainage runnel. This goes along the diagonal portions of the park and is intended to collect the stormwater off of the sidewalks. Um, <coughs> as an exposed aggregate, it'll just be a roughened concrete surface. It's not intended for walking. It's intended to slow the water down before it hits our stormwater features. 
The next three items, um, one of which was included in the original value engineering and the other two are being proposed. This is changing the pavers at the f three corners of the park um, from pavers to a concrete surface. These were already impervious pavers and so it's still staying as an impervious surface. The next change comes at the performance space which was designated outside of City Hall Park steps. This space was originally to be all pavers. Uh, in the proposal, we are changing um, the pavers inside of Park Lane to be pervious pavers, which will be um, congruent with or uh, will match the rest of Park Lane. And then the performance space, which is west of that, will turn into concrete. Uh, this has a function in the fact that it actually becomes a, a little bit easier of a surface to work with for those who are setting up and, and actually performing and using that space to have an even concrete surface uh, versus what can happen to pavers sometimes in our climate. The next item is elimination of 400 linear feet of granite curbing. This hasn't been identified specifically, um, but there are several gardens, edges within the park that are currently um, bounded and edged by granite. The idea is that we will work with parks and the project team to identify areas where these raised beds don't necessarily need to be raised and they can be at the same surface as the sod and the grass. The next change is uh, of the first deduct to the College Street Terrace. This is the area um, just west of the Reraz establishment and before you hit Park Lane. Uh, in there, there are granite stairs that were being proposed that we are uh, proposing to change to concrete. Uh, moving down, we hit the uh, retaining walls throughout the park. There are retaining walls at the College Street Terrace, along the Main Street South Edge, um, at the BCA Plaza Edge, that were to be a granite veneered wall. We are proposing to make these a form finished concrete. They could be a colored concrete. They can be any finish that we are looking for. Uh, they're still a very durable material that will more than serve their purpose as a seat wall. The next change is regarding the bathrooms. Uh, this change was proposed by SD Ireland where they proposed taking, um, removing the off the shelf Portland Loo that the project team had selected and providing a wood construction <coughs> restroom facility. They thought for the um, cost that was remaining in the project that they could actually probably build two bathrooms in this one location versus the one off the shelf. The next change comes to the rain garden on the south wall. This is a small change, um, but with changing the south wall to a concrete material, we thought that it was best to change the granite blocks that serve as a bridge over this rain garden to also be concrete to match materials. The next change that is listed in this table uh, talks about changing the wood benches to metal benches. This was not a change that was proposed in the original value engineering that's in your memo, but is one that is being proposed tonight. These benches are still within the Great Street style. They are just um, a less costly alternative to the wood bench. The last one in this table uh, that's in the memo is the tree grates, and that is changing the tree grates and guards to being the park standard style versus the Great Street style. So summing up the uh, items that appear in column D of what's being displayed, that represents the $296,000 uh, $296, that was the value engineering um, deducted from the base bid represented in the budget that was presented in the memo. The further work that has occurred since that time um, is DPW has taken a closer look at the items that are inside of the bid for SD Ireland. We looked at items such as the traffic control officers that may or may not have been used uh, to help trucks get in and out of the site um, and maybe help with work near the St. Paul Street signal and thought that this is not a cost that needs to be carried at this amount. The use of variable message boards um, we actually struggle with this on other contracts. DPW owns four of these ourselves. We don't necessarily feel the need to have a contractor pay or cost us what is the cost of a board that we own. So we will be providing those. The next item is elimination of the uplighting for BCA. So this was a change that was made um, from what is permitted. The permit plans for the park show uplighting on both City Hall Park and the Firehouse Gallery. In looking at the work that was anticipated for City Hall, we had broken out the uplighting of City Hall as a separate adult. 
uh, which we are not electing to take inside of the contract. For consistency purposes, we are proposing to eliminate the uplighting at the BCA building. This serves a dual function in that the video camera systems that uh, exist around City Hall Park's building to watch its building facade, similar with BCA, there is a potential for interference of the uplighting with those systems. The next item um, eliminates the remaining portions of the proposed wood construction bathroom, um, leaving only the underground facilities as discussed um, during the Board of Finance, but for your benefit here tonight, this is something that we you know, would likely come forward with at a later date and time, uh, maybe when the city's bathroom policies are a little bit better ironed out. But it is being proposed to be removed from SDR Island's contract at this time. The next one um, on the maps that were distributed to you is the elimination of the granite bollards and metal fencing on the College Street edge of the park. This is shown as a red line on your plan. This is a decorative fencing that was to be used to help keep people out of the heavily landscaped bed. Um, we feel that the landscaping and the curbing on that side will be sufficient to help keep pedestrians contained to the right of way and the landscaping will also assist. The next item is removal of the College Street Terrace in its entirety. Again, this is the area that is shown that is impervious <coughs> right next to the Reros establishment and before Park Lane. Um, as shown on the map, it is a dark green. The area that is inside the right-of-way of sidewalk would still remain. It just would not get replaced under the project. This area would become grass. Um, next is Outside of the Firehouse BCA Gallery, this entire space between the Firehouse Gallery and the ellipse in the center was proposed to be pavers. They are all impervious pavers at the moment. We are proposing to change the pavers that would be inside of Park Lane to be a pervious material, and then the other material would go to concrete. I do want to point out that inside of the plan, the east to west walkway that goes from the alleyway all the way out to St. Paul Street is also concrete. So as you look at the blue square out next to the Firehouse Gallery, that is still a concrete area and it would just blend with that pathway. Um, the changes that happen at both the performance space and the Firehouse Gallery are going to be adding additional areas of pervious material and hardscape to this plan that were not previously in the design. Uh, and the last proposal is removal of a small section of the ellipse wall. Um, this is the area that is circled in a red bubble on your map. Um, the designers, when they proposed this section of the ellipse, indicated that it would create uh, better separation between the Firehouse Plaza space and the programming that may or may not happen inside of the ellipse area. Um, the design team or the city team feels that this could also be accomplished with uh, evergreen landscaping. And then finally, so that, so that concludes uh, the proposed changes that would come from the scope of work inside of the park and related to SDR Island's budgets and proposals. The other items that we identified to find savings um, one is the reduction in contingency that needs to be carried. So as we reduce the construction contract down, we're also going to ratchet down the contingency appropriately. The next item is to remove the on-call engineering MPM services that are shown in the memo. This is to basically have provided the Parks Department with MPM services to manage a construction project uh, throughout the, the duration. This service will now be provided by DPW uh, as the replacement for the need for that, that um, guidance. And then finally is removal of contracted resident engineering services and using DPW to provide those. Councilor Pine, the floor is still yours. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Acting President. <laughs> so I just want to... Um, I want to thank staff for, for all the work they've done. It's been um, a difficult process. Um, I'll be the first to confess that uh, nine years ago or eight years ago, I was an employee at CETO when this project began, and I actually wasn't that excited about it. I actually thought that there was a much less expensive way 
and I probably still do believe as a frugal Yankee that I am that there's probably a less expensive way to do this. But um, that's not really our decision tonight in a sense because we gave the green light uh, last summer when we approved to move forward. So um, in echoing the comments of Councilman O'Dell, I don't think that's actually what we're here to debate tonight. Um, the construction contracts that came in, the bids that came in, uh, reflect uh, market conditions and reflect perhaps some elements of the project that are maybe too rich for our blood. And so the administration has shaved the project cost accordingly. There is a level of, of taxpayer dollars that was the same as it was. Um, uh, there's no additional taxpayer dollars over what was pledged to support this project. So I think that um, in light of that, um, I'm going to offer the amendments to effectuate the uh, changes that were just described by staff. All right, so um, starting at uh, inserting at line 58, uh, would now say, whereas city staff and city councilors have worked to find opportunities for cost savings, including value engineering and self-performing some of the work included in the project as detailed in table one. Table one is the one that was handed out recently by Jordan. It has a blue line uh, separating uh, down about two thirds of the way down the page. Next uh, change is, I'm gonna list all these and then we'll I guess review them as a slate. That'd be okay. Uh, so inserting at line 90 after city council should say accepts the construction budget and scope changes described in table one and, and continue as, as it is now. Inserting at line 96 after budget to be in conformance with table one, which includes a source with a maximum of $1,250,000 of, of property taxes as reflected by the CIP annual bond and penny for parks categories on the budget and up to $3,415,163 <coughs> from the other listed sources. In lines, uh, I need to do this together with in line 83 uh, to substitute $4,776,193.70 with $4,474,282. In uh, also in that line, excuse me, it would go from $476,046 to be replaced with $445,854.80. Uh, substituting total maximum contract of $5,252,239.70 with a new number of $4,920,000. And then lastly, in line 102, substitute interfund loan amount of 902,897 with 358,807 dollars. Okay, the motion has been made by Councilor Pine, seconded by Councilor Dean. It's on the floor. Councilor Pine, do you need the floor back or are we opening it I, up to the council? I think, I think I'd just like to close by saying um, as much as I wish we were at a different place and as much as I actually supported putting this question to the voters, we lost that fight another day. We are here today where we are because we went through the political process and this is where we've landed. I prefer to work with the reality that we exist with rather than wish that we had a different uh, outcome and hold on to that wish. So I'd rather just work together to do that. All right, great. Thank you, Councilor Pine. Councilor Paul is the first one that was in the queue, yep. then Councilor Mason, then Councilor Hartnett. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a couple of questions that I wanted to ask. Uh, um, so yep. I'm not sure that, you know, in the, in the presentation, and I, I only heard part of the presentation at the Board of Finance, and I think you might have even said it, and it may have slipped by me. Um, one of the things about the park design that I think people do like is the, um, uh, the, the stormwater and the pervy and the, the less pervious, yes, more pervious surface, um, not impervious. And y you mentioned something and you had said, it, it, and I, so I don't want to put words in your mouth. Did you say that there would be more or less 
impervious or pervious, however you want to put it. <laughs> okay. Or is there going to be more or less, just so that we can all sort of understand that? So for clarification, the proposed revisions under the amendment will increase the pervious surfaces in the park and decrease the impervious by removal of the College Street Terrace. Okay. So it's both. All right. So there will be more pervious surfaces, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. On Park Lane. All right. Now, um, then my, uh, my next question is, you know, one of the ways that some of these costs have been adjusted is because um, some of the work is going to be done in-house. Correct. Okay. So <clears throat> there's limited resources in the city. Um, most of the time I hear that, you know, departments are pretty stretched. They, they, the construction season is only so long and there's so much that needs to be done. How is it that... Um, how do those two um, sort of work together? If there is so much to be done and departments are stretched, then how is it that some of the work is going to be done in-house and other things are not going to be sacrificed? I wouldn't say that nothing's going to be sacrificed. Obviously, it doesn't impact other, other projects and other, other schedules, but we, um, the fortune is that we have had Additional Norm, could you pull the microphone in, please? I, we can't I hear can't you. Add additional staff added to our program in the last year, and we're finally getting up to speed with full staffing. So there's an opportunity there, but doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't have an impact to other projects. You know, a particular thing that comes to my mind is if we were to assign people to this project, how would we advance Rock Point Bridge project? All these things have an impact, but we will make it work. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Powell. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Hard President Wright. Um, my question is for Ms. Wheelock. I, I think I, I scribbled as I heard you say that you were here for public forum. We heard a number of comments about people who would like us to divert these funds to other you know, necessary projects, whether it's sidewalk, memorial. But I thought I heard you in your presentation say that there would be, you know, $827,000 in available funds if the park does not go forward and that of that 500, half a million would be spoken for because of you know necessary remediation. So it's late and my math is simple, but <laughs> am I correct that your position is that if we were not to move forward with this project, there would be a net $327,000 available to the city to use in other projects in the downtown? Is that... Correct? That, that is correct, and I reviewed it with the CAO uh, as we were working through those numbers. The, the remaining funds in the park are, have, ha have high designations with them. They're either donations um, or they are funds that come from the Champlain College development fee, and without an actual park project to use those as an improvement in the downtown, they're not eligible. Okay. So the only remaining funds that we have yet to have spent either on the design contract um, or are eligible to date come from the CIP bond and the CIP institutional revenue and a very small portion of the pennies for parks that have yet to be spent. And that's how adding up those line items, um, I get to the $820,000. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Councillor Hartnett. Yeah, just some general comments uh, in reference to this a project and, and deferring funds and using funds for this and using funds for that. I've given up that fight a long time ago. Right? I've, I've used that excuse and talked about that so many times about, you know, we have four guys out removing snow from bike lanes in the middle of March, right? <laughs> Heavy equipment, why aren't we spending money elsewhere, right? But I, so when I hear that, I kind of feel your frustration because I'm not quite sure how it all works. And um, I, sometimes I don't even want to hear the answer, actually. Uh, but in regards to Councillor Pine, uh, you, you know, the changes that we made. You know, one of the last things I want to do is I don't want to cheapen this, right? I mean, this is, this is the, the, the diamond in the rough here at downtown. This is extension of Church Street. This is, this is going to be something that I hope we look back on and that, and I know there's people in this room that, you know, don't want this design and don't want this project. And they say six million is way too much money. And reality is one dollar is way too much money for those people, right? They don't want this project to happen. I get it. I understand that. And I'd rather have you just say that and be up front and honest with us, right? That one dollar would be too much for you guys. And that's great. 
I, I get it, but that's not where we're at in the process, right? And so I didn't really want to take funds away from this. I didn't want to cheapen it. I didn't want to take the bathrooms away. I do want to use granite. I want this to be the, the nicest looking park that we have in the city of Burlington because it's in the heart of our downtown and we should be proud of that. A few years back, I was going crazy up here because we were gonna spend $4 million on a skate park at the waterfront. $4 million on a skate park. I said, are we nuts, right? And I go by there now every day and I see that park filled and I see people coming from all over to use it and I see families and I see kids and I say to myself, geez, I was wrong. Right? If I had that vote over again, I'd vote to support that park. It's quality of life. It brings people to Burlington. We should be proud of that. Nice things cost money. I get it. I understand it. And it's tough on taxpayers, but we're not increasing that side of this. We always knew what the taxpayers were going to put into this project. Right? And so I'm sad tonight that I'm going to support some of the changes just so this will pass because I do think we're cheapening this project and I think we're jipping ourselves and we don't realize it. And that to me is too bad. Thank you, Councillor Hartnett. Councillor Busher, and then Councillor Tracy. Thank you. Um, so we're talking about the amendment that's being put forward by, yeah, by Councillor Pine, okay. Um, so there are parts of the amendment that are spot on talking about the fact that um, the city staff and counselors have worked really hard um, to find ways to save money. Um, and so I, I agree with that. Um, but I think that, I think that I, I'm kind of surprised at the conversation. So if you design an addition to your house and the cost comes in too high, you then start, you can do a couple of things. You can either redesign or you can start eliminating things, okay? Um, but then when you get down to making, reducing, eliminating some things that are, if it was an addition to your house that needed bathrooms and you've eliminated that, then it makes you rethink, is this really the direction I should be going in or should I be giving this a second look? To me, I think it is germane to talk about the cost. I don't think that is, that's off the table. I think the plan is off the table, but the cost is not. The cost is what brings us together this is why we're here to talk about the contract for the reconstruction of City Hall Park, and it is the cost. So to me, that is germane. And so I don't accept the argument that it's not what we should be talking about. Um, I think the cost is related to the quality of materials. I spoke about concrete versus granite, concrete pits. And we heard an architect or someone come up and say that it, the life expectancy, which I can't speak to, is a lot shorter than granite. I know that to be true, but I can't speak about how, what the life expectancy is. I think that the fact that I was told there's more concrete in this design, that's what I was told at the Board of Finance. So I do believe there's more concrete in the design. Um, and so I need clarification about that. And then the other piece is that there were changes to this plan. And I guess I'm surprised that everyone's like, oh, hum, well, we're just changing the plan. Whereas when we were talking about the trees, we weren't going to change anything except what trees were removed. So now we would change the plan. And one example is you're going to um, put in, you're going to eliminate the raised beds for planters. So if you eliminate the raised beds, people are going to trample on those plants. That was the point of the raised beds. So I think people have to start thinking about really what we're talking about here. At least I'm trying to kind of simulate all of this in a very short period of time. I don't appreciate <coughs> the fact that I have tonight to decide this when everything was so fluid. And I understand things are happening as we speak but I think we create the pressure. We create the short timeline. I'm not convinced this is the timeline. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Busher. Councillor Tracy. 
Thank you. Um, so I have a question first, and it's really with regards to some of the choices that were made in terms of eliminating certain elements versus others. And so I was wondering how much uh, specifically the splash pad cost and why there wasn't a decision to eliminate that instead of the bathrooms, for instance, which is something that we have a dire need. I mean, people are peeing on the side of this building. Um, so fundamentally, one of the funding sources for the park does come from a donation, and it does relate to construct, reconstructing the water feature in the park. Um, so it's not a choice of an idea or an, an item that we can eliminate. Um, we have worked extensively on trying to find what the right balance is for the water feature in the park, and ultimately it came down to we could eliminate a few of the jets that go into the splash pad without having to force a major redesign of the entire system, the vaults, the piping, and the aesthetics that go with the splash pad. Um, in the timeline of this value engineering and with the premise of not trying to redesign the entire park. So we did look at it. It's um, not an element that's as easy to change out. A lot of these materials we already had with inside the existing bid and we are just expanding those areas. The value, as you asked, um, the fountain came in around 620,000 for the unit item, but that does not include the civil site work that goes with it. Thank you. Thank so, you. Oops, continue. So I just want to continue a little bit. So I appreciate that, and I certainly appreciate all the hard work that this that both the folks in Parks and DPW have done on this project. This is not necessarily an issue, a commentary on, on you as, as professionals, and I certainly appreciate that. However, I do think that, the, that it's been um, very challenging um, to fully understand this in the context of tonight when items are just being loaded to board docs when um, we're having the meeting. Seriously, if you go on board docs right now, you see documents being loaded on at 640 or something like that, and that's a really difficult way to do that. And I would also pick up on Sharon's comment that we were, uh, that people opposed eliminating any sort of pervious or any, any sort of impervious surface uh, in the context of the, the, the tree discussion, but now, are suddenly okay at the last minute doing so. I also think that there, so I think there's certainly a, a process issue here and one that was only um, exacerbated by the, the intervening step that took place, which was the fact that folks, uh, that folks went through a petition process and had that petition voted, voted down uh, or not allowed to proceed, so we didn't really truly get that check-in. Um, so I think there's certainly that aspect, and then I think there's also an issue of, of, of prioritization that's really hard to weigh um, in the context of having these decisions sooner, and I don't know how to weigh all of these competing desires. Moreover, I don't know necessarily how to weigh the desires of the public because they really haven't had a chance to adequately comment on this because a lot of these final changes are really only coming to us tonight and haven't had a full, fully adequate public review, meaning that, you know, we could go to the public if we take more, take a step back and say, Portland Lou or splash pad? Like, do you need bathrooms or do you need a splash pad? And we haven't had that chance. And so while I appreciate the, uh, the efforts towards, towards cost cutting, I don't know that I can fully, that I can support either this amendment or ultimately the, the full resolution because I think that there's issues of process and prioritization that are present here that have not been adequately weighed or given enough time to be worked out. Thank you, Councilor Tracy. Councilor Paul. I just, thank you. Um, you know, this is, uh, uh, I think this is a really good example of um, what I think, I'm trying to remember who it was that said this tonight, it might have been Councillor Nodell, I can't remember, is, but someone said that, you know, a lot of these decisions are not at all black and white, they are very, very difficult, um, and weighing all of these is, 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 is challenging, it's really challenging. Um, you know, I, my understanding about the splash pad is that one of the philanthropic donations was made, um, and I wouldn't say contingent, I would say in part because of a family member who they want to name that splash pad after, a woman who was a, um, uh, in a wheelchair, and this was in a way that um, people who are um, not as able-bodied as many of us are able to enjoy aspects of the summer by being able to be in a, um, a flat surface 
with water. Um, you know, and I certainly know there's plenty of kids that love those as well. Is that, is that basically um, why that is not being offered as an option to reconsider? I think that's in part one reason, but the other reason, of course, is obviously when you start significantly changing the design of the project, you, you run the peril of going back through a permitting process or redesign. So in other words, what you're saying is that not only is there that consideration, but if you change that, you're then in a position where you have to go back and basically go through part of the process again in terms of permitting? Correct. I, I don't think that the size of the splash pad is in the permitting. Um, I think that we would be free to change that. It is it's a significant months of redesign from the designer. Um, again, the size of the system, we have three pumps. If we reduce beyond three jets, we now need to go to two pumps. It's a different size vault, it's a different size containment, it's a different size chlorination, it's different piping sizes, it's everything. It's not just removing five heads or six heads to save $15,000. You're gonna be paying design costs that go with that and you're gonna lose your trade off. So it's, it's not about permitting, it's about the months of design and the, the value you could save by reducing the size of the, of the splash item, you're gonna pay back a portion of that in the design costs. Okay, so when you came up with this list of potential um, uh, savings to the project, you were not only looking for changes that you could make that would lower the cost, but also where there wouldn't be a trade-off. Or there cost basic, to them. New cost. To be or there would be a, a new cost created. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Councillor Dean and then Councillor Pine. Thank you, President Wright. Um, I'd like to start by saying welcome to my world. <laughs> uh, I can't uh, even begin to count the number of hours that I've spent sitting down with design teams of which I am a part engineering teams and owners and talking through how to make the changes that are necessary to get a project in so you can actually construct it. And I'm in that process right now with a much larger project on a scale of 10 times to 15 times the cost of this project. And we, these are capable designers, capable engineers, capable uh, cost estimators and, and construction managers, and we're all working on a very thorny issue of how to get the project down to cost. So I think there has been some suggestions tonight that somehow the, the, the city's team had not done their work, that they hadn't paid attention to the details, um, that, they, you know, that there had been a, a slip up here, and I don't think that's true at all. It's part, and, and we're seeing this on projects we're working on currently, where the market is really not bringing us the, the, the based on past, we can't use past expectations to understand what the costs are um, to us um, coming back from the market because it just the, 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 the materials are up, people are busy, uh, they have they have their dance card filled, and so they you know uh, uh, with a little uncertainty they're going to raise their prices. Um, so we uh, I think we've seen changes in the project um, that ha are that and it's very logical that we're seeing that the cost increases that have come back to us. Um, so I also would offer, uh, offer just a couple more thoughts about the value engineering process, and, and we face this all the time with all the projects that we do, um, where you get to the point where you have to make cuts. And I think, you know, we've wrestled, and the team has wrestled with this effectively in that majority of the, the cuts that are offered, or a significant number of the cuts that are offered are in material changes. And so if you look at granite or you look at concrete, Granted, it is a wonderful material, but stepping back to concrete still leaves the function in place. You can still walk on it, it's still durable. It doesn't provide perhaps as much of the aesthetic value, but it still works. Um, I think that's true of the benches that are proposed for substitutions, um, uh, you know, the, the pervious pavers and so forth that are, play, are proposed where concrete is now. Those all are not perceived by the, the, you know, the public, and I'm not sure people even noticed the details previously that, that had these in place. So taking them away, although painful, does not change the essence of the project. I think, you know, eliminating the message board, the uplighting to the, the you know, the, the firehouse, the BCA headquarters, um, as, 
those are those are things that we didn't even I think most, majority of the public didn't even know those features were there. So taking them away again seems like a logical step when you're it, when you're when you're faced with this situation. So I I, I think that you know. My, the overall summary to what I'm saying, first of all, value engineering or value management is the, this process. Um, it's for definition as, as, um, <laughs> as uh, Councillor Paul requested. Um, this is normal, it's, it's difficult, it's what we do all the time, and I commend the, the city and the team for doing a, an excellent job in bringing us a proposal that allows this project, that has the potential to allow this project to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dean. Councillor Pine. Sure. One, Mr. President, one question is just a yes or no question, but it's to the table, the members of the panel here, the staff. Is the current uh, value engineering, does the current value engineering um, eliminate the, the public restroom? Yes. Okay. I understood that, but a councillor at this table okay. didn't, so I just wanted to clarify that. And so therefore, there'd be no bathroom under the current proposal. The other thing I just want to ask is, um, if the staff could answer the question Councillor Busher raised, which is, is there more concrete? And I think the answer is more concrete, but less impervious surfaces is what I heard you say. So yeah, you so in the essence of trying to answer the question as it was asked, technically there will be more yards of concrete poured into the park, but it's in place of the pavers. So the amount of impervious area in the park will be reduced because the College Street Terrace is being eliminated and the amount of impervious surface, specifically related to Park Lane being changed to pervious pavers, incre increases the amount of pervious surface that was previously impervious. We are not adding any patios or any terraces or any of those areas. There will be more grass and more pervious pavers in the proposal. I'll say Councillor Pine. Councillor Jang. Thank you. Um, couple of thoughts, and I think the first one is about the bathroom. So there won't be any bathroom in the park as it is right now. No restroom, no bathroom, nothing. Correct. Only the piping ready to receive a bathroom will be installed. Okay. And if we wanted to add a bathroom, would that increase the cost of the design? Not only the cost of the bathroom, but will that increase the cost? The contractor had proposed that that would be about a $40,000 increase to put a stick-built bathroom in there, and that would include uh, a design element for it. Okay. So now, the park is no longer $6.3 million. What is the current cost without the bathroom right now? Five point eight four. Five point eight. And of that five point eight, one point five point three is donation. Right? Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Welcome. Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, President Wright. Um, first, uh, just a couple of clarifications, maybe help with the conversation, and then sure to uh, just like to share my kind of uh, bigger picture thoughts on, on the moment we're at here. Um, first of all, um, with respect to, to the bathrooms, I want to be really clear on this. The, the amendment, um, as it's being proposed, would remove, for now, all of the above ground elements of the bathroom. Uh, however, uh, all of the utilities to that uh, are still included in this, and we would have you know, about a year and a half until the new park opens to, to find a way to get that bathroom back in there. Certainly I've heard loud and clear from the public this is something they want. Um, uh, we have a real need for it, and as we know in a variety of ways, when this park opens, there will be a bathroom there, and we will find a way to replace that funding. Uh, the, the, this, we are going, this allows us to go forward tonight and with uh, consensus and a way forward. Um, but I, I'm committed to finding a way to, to get that back in there. I don't know whether it's going to be more philanthropy or it's going to be hustling in some other way, but we will get a bathroom back in there. Um, there may be some thought if we can make that a little easier by finding, you know, I would welcome that, but I, I'm committed to doing that. 
Secondly, uh, I want to be just really clear the, about the <coughs> this um, change from pavers, pervious, from, from pavers to concrete in some places is resulting in some additional water being able to flow into the ground, which is, may sound unintuitive, but I mean, the hydraulic, there's actually going to be more infiltration as a result of those material changes, not less. Uh, I do want to caution on the College Street Terrace, while the changes tonight will temporarily uh, increase um, the uh, pervious surface there, um, that too is an area where there may be solutions in the future to bring that back and I don't want to be selling that. That change is being done from my perspective purely for cost saving reasons, not for programmatic reasons and uh, I just don't want to be accused of misrepresenting in the future if that idea re revives in some other way. That may be something that there may be, again, third party sources for, for funding in some way in the future but it is coming out tonight but maybe not forever. Let me just step back and just give a bigger picture sense of, of you know, kind of my sense of where we're at. I, I you know, it, Richard's exactly right. These value engineering um, efforts are the worst parts of being in construction and development. They're, t they're always painful and hard, and to have to do that in this group process uh, in this way uh, makes it even harder, but I think uh, I really do appreciate the team working through the weekend in response to counselors to put something in front of you tonight that we can act on, and. And uh, I, think, I think you've described it very clearly. Um, I think if we get away from the weeds where we are for a moment, I think this is a really exciting night for the city of Burlington. We are on the cusp of making a decision that is gonna ensure that we take this very troubled space that has plagued the city for decades. There have been demands from the public for decades to do something about. We are on the cusp of making the final decision that is going to dramatically improve this uh, key public space in the heart of our downtown. Uh, great public spaces require a real investment. Uh, Councilor Hartnett's exactly right about that. We know that if we, we can reflect on that. Uh, whether it's down on Waterfront Access North with the skate park or a little farther north in the Urban Reserve where we built a, a, a new park uh, out in what used to be Texaco Beach or at the airport. Um, these, uh, these, we know these are great, uplifting public spaces. They totally change the character of the community. They make, they're part of what makes Burlington a great place. Um, uh, we are, we all remember, I think, those of us on this council, how great the reaction from the public was when we opened those spaces on the northern waterfront just a couple years ago. Uh, when we opened the new City Hall Park, I am totally confident, um, even with having to make some concessions tonight, we are going to be opening a public space that is vastly better than the one we have today, that is going to be appreciated by the public greatly when it's there, and that is going to be benefit this um, community um, for generations. So uh, we got a chance to do something big tonight. Um, I really hope we grab this opportunity and don't let it slip through our fingers. If we do, I think we'll regret it. I think we will, in contrast, instead of having that great uh, public moment as a city in our near future, we instead will spend many, many years walking by this downtrodden site the way it is today, and we won't get this opportunity back for a long time. Let's not blow it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other city councilor? I think we, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize, Councilor Roof. <laughs> Missed me twice, President Wright. Uh, just a point of clarification, we're still on the Pine Amendment, is that what We is that are, okay. yes we are. Yeah, okay, so we're, still, we're a little bit moving around a little Hope bit. Hope to so. get to the end of it. <laughs> uh, and on the, so I'll, I'll maybe reserve some comments for, for after this vote, but I, I'm gonna support this amendment because I feel it represents a, a good faith effort to try to get this, uh, this plan, this budget, to a position where it can pass the majority of this council. Uh, because we are not debating whether or not this should have been on the ballot. We're not debating whether or not the process was flawed at some point in time or at any point in time. Tonight, the question that we have as the city council is whether or not to move forward a plan that has been approved in multiple iterations by this council or a makeup that looks primarily similar to it. Um, and whether or not we want to fund that project. And we're, we're being eyes wide open and upfront that the sticker shock was real and that the that there was an estimate that we were operating under and it came in higher than many of us were were comfortable with and this this amendment uh, represents like i said an effort to mitigate that sticker shock and still find a way to be action oriented meaning try to find a way to move forward so i'll be supporting this amendment and maybe i'll chime back in when we get to back to the item 
Thank you, Councilor Roof. I think we are ready to vote. The clerk shall call the roll. Councillor Bushor. This is on, yes, this is on the Pine Amendment. We are voting on the Pine Amendment and the clerk is calling the roll. No. <coughs> Councillor Dean. Yes. Councillor Jing. Yes. Councillor Hartnett. Yes. Councillor Nodell. Yes. Councillor Mason. Yes. Councillor Paul? Yes. Councillor Pine? Yes. Councillor Roof? Yes. Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Tracy? No. City Council President Wright? Yes. Ten ayes, two nays. The amendment passes by a vote of 10 to 2. Councillor Pine's amendment, and we are on to the actual resolution now, as amended three times. And we'll recognize Councilor Hartnett to start out. I, um, I just, just for a brief second, want to go back to the bathrooms. I, I did support the amendment, but I am disappointed the bathrooms aren't there. After spending, I think, one public safety meeting, two hours talking about uh, writing uh, citations for public urination, how close to somebody has to be to a bathroom downtown to get that citation, I mean, the, 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 the need is real for those. And to cut those out, it, it's, it's really unfortunate. Um, and so, but again, to Councilor Pine's point, you gotta deal with what you gotta deal with and you gotta make concessions and you gotta get this thing done. But I really, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I might not be sitting here, but I'm not leaving Burlington and I'll be watching. And this, this has gotta happen, right? We gotta have public bathrooms. And, and nice public bathrooms, right? It's, they gotta be, I mean, come on, right? So I really hope that we're committed to do that and to get the resources and the financing for them. Thanks. Okay, Councilor Roof, and now we are back again. We are back on the actual resolution now. Uh, uh, Councilor over. Hartnett touched on what I want to touch on. I've, I've spent, um, Dave, your Councilor Hartnett was in that meeting. A lot of time has gone into thinking about how in the downtown we can offer more publicly accessible bathrooms. I don't look at maybe at the same, this in the same way that, that Councillor Hartner does in a sense. Um, we are gonna have that bathroom in City Hall Park. And if this proposal came forward by eliminating the underlying, literally the underlying infrastructure required to have a bathroom in the park, it would have been a non-starter for me. And I thank the team being thoughtful enough to, to maintain that. Like I said in my, in a few minutes ago, we are working towards a, a budget that the majority of this body can support because I, we, we are trying to be action oriented here, trying to move forward uh, with progress. Uh, whether or not it comes from a donation, where the mayor spoke to this pretty well, um, the bathroom is needed and, and quite frankly, if I were to go into a room and design the, the bathroom piece of this park, it would look a lot different. There'd be a lot more bathrooms. We'd build them, we would build them six months ago. Uh, but that's not the way that process works. In, in Burlington. And so love it or hate it at its final, final iteration or maybe agnostic on it in the final iteration, this is the product of, a, of at least you can all agree on a long process mm -hmm. that has gotten us to a point where this body is being asked to do its job, which is to vote and make a decision. Uh, I'll be voting yes on this and I look forward to uh, working to make the park plan uh, even better knowing that we have uh, some concessions being made here tonight. Thank you, Councilor Roof. Other councilors, or are we ready to vote? We just had a significant debate. Councilor Jang. Yes. No water. <laughs> but I think it's important also to highlight that yes, this will have my vote, and I think I stated why. You know, the community will not be paying much money for this park, and Burlington need to stay the best city in the state and also be competitive regionally. And I think in order for people to come here, they should see beautiful things. We need to build assets. And then when we have them, we strengthen them, we polish them, we keep them. And I think the park is one of them. But one thing is clear. I will never forget, and personally, the way that this council refused to give the resident of this city a vote about this issue. 
it doesn't matter where I stand, but I think I was here when we refused to tell people of Burlington you don't have a say into this. Thank you. Thank and you, Councilor. My vote is yes. Thank you, Councilor Jang. We are ready to vote. The clerk shall call the roll. Councilor Bushar? No. Councilor Dean? Yes. <clears throat> Councilor Jang? Yes. Councilor Hartnett? Yes. Councilor Nodell? Yes. Councilor Mason? Yes. Councilor Paul? Yes. Councilor Pine? Yes. Councilor Roof? Yes. Councilor Shannon? Yes. Councilor Tracy? No. City Council President Wright? Yes. Ten ayes, two nays. The City Hall Park plan moves forward with a 10 to 2 positive vote. Item 4.07 is a public hearing regarding the Burlington Municipal Development Plan. Uh, so we, um, Megan and Chair of the Planning Commission, Andy Montreal, yeah. okay. sure. will maybe just give us a very brief couple of sentences on this, then we'll have the public hearing and, and the vote, presumably. Thank you. Um, very briefly, we're here tonight for the second public hearing on the update to the Municipal Development Plan called Plan BTV. Um, after the uh, Council President opens the floor for public comment, um, we are asking you to consider a resolution this evening to readopt that plan update, um, which includes a number of incorporated and referenced plans, um, including Plan BTV South End, uh, which is the only plan that has not previously been approved by this board. You've already heard a lot about the plan, so um, we're open to questions, but unless you have any questions, I think we're all set with it. Okay. Um, Councilor Busher does have a question. Yes. Um, so um, thank you. Thank you, President Wright. Um, in your, first of all, this is a very nice overview um, um, of the goals, but I didn't see anything referenced regarding Centennial Woods. And is there anything referenced in, and I know that I can't start this over again, I'm not suggesting that, but it seemed to be an omission that maybe shouldn't be an omission. In terms of the plans that are referenced or just in terms of how the woods are discussed in the plan overall? It I'm seemed as far as, you know, you talk generically about goals, about, um, historic settlement, uh, anyways, as you go through your goals, there's nothing, there's, there's a discussion about environment, there's a discussion about a lot of things, air quality, um, but there isn't really any reference to Centennial Woods, and I thought that was an omission maybe, but I just am asking you. Sure, so um, in the plan we talk uh, pretty extensively about the entire network of open spaces and natural areas in the city. Um, one of the main themes of the land use section is about areas of the city that we're planning to conserve and, and really enhance as those natural open spaces. So certainly in that section of the plan, we point to Centennial Woods, we map it that way, that it's an area that we want to conserve for that purpose. Um, but we discuss the relationship to our open space protection plan, which discusses each one of the city's natural areas and open spaces in much greater detail in terms of their value and the other ecological or ecosystem benefits that they provide to okay, the city. So it is there. It's in that. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I missed it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Busher. Any other questions for the team? Hearing none, thank you very much. We will open up the public hearing. So opening the second public hearing on the BTV plan. Uh, is there anyone who would like to speak in the public forum on this issue? Going once, going twice, gone. This is, uh, we are in a public forum right now. This is just for the public forum, right? From a public. Yeah. Make it here today. From someone from the Go ahead, make it, make the, go ahead. It's okay. Thank go ahead, make the, if you want to read it, go ahead. Okay, all right. So we'll close the public hearing and now we will take a motion from Councillor Dean. 
Thank you, President Wright. I would move that we waive the reading, adopt the resolution, and after a second, request the floor back. Seconded by Councillor Roof. You have the floor back, Councillor Dean. Thank you, President Wright. So I think we need to recognize um, how important this plan is to us um, and the work that has been put into bringing it to us today. Um, it's targeted for providing a real response to what is frequently asked, I think, which is, do we have a vision for our city? And why don't we have a plan BTV for the whole city? So this represents an answer to that question. And one of the primary objectives of this update was to make the plan BTV comprehensive plan something that could be well known by all members of the community. It could be more interesting to read, and I think that it achieves that goal and more relevant and relatable to all of us. And I think you know, what we've seen is that a, a document, this is a rewrite of an existing document that used to be 200 pages, is now 100, and that was 200 black and white pages, is now 100 pages with some really kind of engaging uh, dialogue and, and, and diagrams that show what we're thinking about the city. And it's organized by issues um, that are relevant to Burlington residents uh, uh, rather than you know, some state statute that has organized previous uh, documents. So I think all of those are to the good and, com and, and a huge commendation to the, the, all of the, the work that's gone in, for all of the work that's gone into this. I, but I also want to recognize one more thing, which is the public engagement process that was um, engaged in to get this to us today where it was not led by an outside consultant, it was led by members of the planning staff and by um, planning commission members who went out there, left City Hall, went out and talked with all kinds of student groups, of uh, student groups, all kinds of, of citizen groups, went to all the NPAs uh, they presented and, and, and made efforts at outreach at uh, the farmer's market, at the One Police Barbecue, the Old North End Police Barbecue event, there were city block parties they were at, and they even connected with people uh, who were at their places of learning. So I think what we see today is a document that really has future relevance for our city. Um, and I think that we all, uh, uh, this is, I'm proud to offer this, these remarks as my last uh, official statement as a, probably as a, a city councilor. And I think uh, encourage all of my fellow city councilors to strongly support this uh, adoption of this plan. Thank you, Councillor Dean. Councillor Mason. Thank you, President Wright. The hour is late and you guys have been sitting there for hours, but I didn't want this moment to go without bringing to the public's attention and the councils that, you know, this, by adoption of this, also moves forward Plan BTV South End. Um, and I want to, as someone who was on the council and there when the plan first got, you know, um, put out for public comment in 2015, and thanking you for sort of taking the visceral reaction um, being responsive and also for the time that, you know, not only just the four of you sitting at this table, but, you know, your staff have done. I think, you know, the revised plan and the rollout that was done was a very different process than the first time. And I think that's because of the effort that you've put in. Um, and I do want to thank you for that. Um, I think the South End will benefit from having this plan actually adopted. And then we can turn to start implementing some of the very important policies that have been put forth. And I know for some of my colleagues around the table, uh, I think they're now looking forward to where do we go next um, other than the South End. So thank you for your efforts and for sitting here for four hours tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. And th thank you all for your hard work on this plan. We really appreciate it. Uh, unless there's some other comments, we are ready to vote. All those in favor of passing re-adoption of Plan BTV, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we apologize for having to wait so late, but thank you. 4.09 is a res resolution regarding a charter change on council recusal issues. Councilor Hartnett. Yeah, I'd like to waive the reading of the resolution and uh, ask for a second and then the floor back briefly. Seconded by Councilor Pine. Councilor Hartnett's got the floor back. Thank you. Um, I did have this teed up to go a few months back and I pulled it and I didn't want this to be about Burlington Telecom um, and I don't want it to be, although uh, we've had this discussion about recusals and responsibility of counselors uh, long before Burlington Telecom, but certainly uh, 
the night of that final vote was probably the lowest moment uh, for me on this council. And it was a disappointing night for sure. And it just you know, made me rethink that night that we need to look at our charter um, in regards to recusals. Um, the resolution itself is vague and, and I'm hope that the charter committee will, will dive into this. I, I think one of the hardest things uh, to do is self-evaluate, right? As an individual, as a body that, you know, you have to look and, uh, and you always want to try to improve and be better and be more transparent. And I think when we all get elected, we raise our right hand, we take an oath and really the oath is, you know, that we would be uh, forthcoming and honest and, and, uh, um, and, and, and transparency. Uh, to the public. I mean, I think that's the single first responsibility we have as elected officials. And, and the charter is very vague when it comes to recusals. And, and I'm hoping that the charter change will take a look at uh, recusals as far as someone recusing themselves right from the very beginning of a process of, of a resolution, but also when we've had those occasions and we've had more than one of them where we have counselors that recuse themselves in the middle of it or towards the end of it, and there's already been votes cast, and, and what does that mean to the city, and, and how should that work? And I, I know I had, uh, saw Councilor Mason's comments in the paper. I, I don't want Councilor Mason to get uh, too nervous. It's not that I want to keep attorneys off the city council, although the thought did cross my mind after I, <laughs> I read the comments, <laughs> to be honest with you. but. Uh, it's not, that's not the purpose. The purpose really is for the charter change to really look at this and to see if we can strengthen that language, right? That we don't, we don't want the pub, we don't want to lose public trust, right? We just cannot afford to do that, right? And this council was badly damaged that night. There was no question about it. And we took a huge credibility hit. And there was no reason for that. So I hope we can move forward. We could take a look at this. I hope the charter change will. I hope they'll come back with some changes. Maybe they won't, um, but my hopes that they will. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Hartner. This is to send it to the charter change committee. Any discussion by the city council? Hearing none, all those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you, Councilor Hartnett. Uh, we will go to item number five, committee reports. Is there any committee chair that needs to give us a brief report? Councilor Tracy. Yeah. Uh, very brief report um, on the transportation committee because there's a couple items that are coming up. Um, we had an issue, we have issues with recycling um, in the city and getting the toters out. And we heard a great report from the, the city um, about the city staff that they've ordered 312 toters. Those toters should arrive by April 30th. So right now they're out. But once April hits, I'll send another recommend, I'll send a, I'll put another reminder out to the council and the public. There's going to be different sizes, 30, 60, and 90 gallons. Um, the budget for next year, it, they're conceiving of quadrupling it, so $50,000 to help subsidize and get more of those toters on. Uh, and that's crucial because we have 12,500 units um, across the city that are needing to have these. On the other issue uh, that we dealt with was the bike and scooter share update. Just want to be very clear with the public about a couple things. No contracts have been signed. No hub locations have been uh, defined with regards to the scooter share. No launch date is set yet. Um, there will be another round of public engagement uh, coming in April around that. Uh, the number of them is still being, uh, of the, the scooters to, to be um, employed will still be um, discussed. So there's a lot still up in the air. Just want to make sure that people who have further feedback, you're going to get your chance on that. Um, two other things were that there is, um, that um, we did talk about crosswalk specifically. There are 29 in the queue, but one that is coming forward um, will be the uh, North Avenue crosswalks, and that's going to be at this week's Wards 4 and 7 MPA with DPW staff on hand. So um, that issue is being addressed along, along with a long queue of other crosswalk uh, requests from the public, so they are working really hard to address those. And then finally, um, there will be an April 8th work session um, regarding uh, water resources, staffing, um, and how that, department, uh, how that aspect uh, of the city um, works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Tracy. Councilor Roof. Uh, public, public Safety Committee, this meet, uh, 
this Thursday, 5.30. It's uh, room 12. We're going to be not taking any action, but there's been some pent up uh, requests around having a, a public hearing on a few items, encampment removal policy, social media policy, a few other important items. So no action plan, but we had, we had the time that works for community members, so we're going to convene and, and, and have some discussions, but no action is contemplated. Thank you, Councilor Roof. Any other committee chair? Pack tomorrow night. Last meeting for me as chair, 5:30. We'll, everybody's on the docket. We're going to get an update from all departments, and we're going to get an update on highlight and how it went. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Hartner. Uh, we'll close out the committee reports now, and with, here, absent any objection, I'm going to change the order. And tonight, the mayor will give his uh, report to us, and then we are going to finish it with something else tonight. Um, well, thank you, President Wright. Um, uh, I think it's very fitting this council that has done uh, so much um, is uh, the, the last session uh, of this council is so busy. It is, it is so busy that it has uh, kind of forced off the deliberate agenda um, some items that I think on another night would have gotten a lot more discussion and note, and I do just want to quickly raise them here. The uh, early learning initiative, the First Step Scholarships Program, the council took the final action tonight to make, um, to fully pass that budget. That budget had been sort of provisionally passed in last year's, uh, in the FY20 budget, with the idea that we would come back, uh, flesh out that First Steps program, have CDNR weigh in on it further, um, have the Board of Finance weigh in on it further. Those two things have happened. And uh, uh, again, uh, we're really trying to get the word out. We know applications are coming in, but there's still time for any households out there that are looking, think they might be interested in a scholarship for toddlers and infants, uh, you have until April 5th to fill out that application. Go to the city's homepage or the family room or any of the child high quality child care providers in town to get more information. Um, uh, I apologize for this. There's a administrative snafu. There was that you may have, you got an email earlier today saying that somehow the, the City Place Burlington um, update uh, from Jeff Glassberg didn't make it into the packet. It has been added to board docs now. You can read it. Uh, it is consistent with everything that has been said publicly and has been written about by some of our colleagues. And, and uh, um, I don't think there are any big surprises in there. The basic, you know, good news from that is that um, the city's experience working in design and construction teams uh, has been consistent with what the developers have been saying publicly. There's a great deal of activity that is taking place right now, and from everything that we can observe and engage in and, and participate in, the, uh, the project seems to be getting back on track and headed towards uh, the start later this spring um, that uh, has been announced. Um, the, uh, we will work, I will work with President Wright and at one of the April meetings, a representative of Brookfield will be back uh, to um, uh, give an in-person update, uh, again, on, in addition to this written update. Um, and then finally, um, uh, the, two, two last things. The, uh, also, at the Board of Finance, and you took action on the consent agenda, the CAO's annual fiscal health report is out, and um, it continues to show that the city is uh, moving in a positive direction financially. I think it's worth noting on a night where we've had this debate about uh, tax dollars and, and investment, we are better positioned to make investments now than we, uh, than we have been in a long time. Um, the city's uh, audit has continued to move in the right direction, and notably, because of the credit rating improvements, we are spending much less on interest costs than we would have had we not um, ha had we not secured those credit rating increases. This year, the the CAO has estimated the pres the dollar savings in 2018 uh, in 2019 dollars to be 17 million dollars in savings over the life of the bonds that we have taken out since the credit ratings began and that will go up and go up a lot in the years to come as we we know we are taking on more borrowing and that will be done much uh, less explicitly than it would have otherwise uh, we'll see everybody back uh, we invite the public in they'll be for the state of the city address uh, next Monday and uh, we look forward to, uh, to, to welcoming thank, um, the public to that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I don't know how you know that I'm going to still be council president come April 8th, but you must know something I don't know. But <laughs> since you said you'd be working with me as council president. Oh, uh, good point. Anyway, um, so we're going back now to finish the night. 
with um, item number seven, City Council President, and I am going to turn it over to Council President, Council President, former Council President Nodell, to wrap the night up as Council President in this seat. But I am first going to, Council, I think that the, her, the career of 20 years and the magnitude of Council Nodell's service here, uh, her service brings a song to my mind. I'm not gonna sing it. I'm not gonna sing it. But it does bring a song to my mind that, that you'll recognize it, and I'm serious about this. We heard Ali Zapparo talk about all the things that you've done. We heard Lauren Glenn Davidian. We heard the people from Ward 2 and Ward 3. And so these are the words which you will recognize, and I just it always reminds me of you. To think you did all that, and may I say, not in a shy way. Oh, no. Oh, no, not Jane. She did it her way. For what is a Jane, no Dell? What has she got? If not herself, then she has not. To say the words she truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. You faced it all and you stood tall and did it your way. taken me back to my glory days as council president, so I appreciate that opportunity. Um, and uh, I'm going to make sure my mother hears that. She's going to love that. Um, but I did want to offer some, some, some thoughts on a little bit more serious side um, about where we are in our political life. And while I had a couple of great weeks, I, had, I was in Cartagena and then Florida, and I was also following very closely what's going on in, in the United Kingdom with, with Brexit. And um, I got, saw this quote of a Labor Party member of parliament, Lisa Nandy, who represents Wigan, and it really resonated with me about where we are in Burlington today. And she, she offered these comments in a column she wrote for The Guardian, and it was after Theresa May kind of issued a scathing rebuke of the parliament. Um, and kind of appealed to the people and kind of cast the parliament against the people. And she took serious offense to this. And she, she, the quote is this, she says, populism, once unleashed, threatens the basis of liberal democracy itself. Democracy is precious and fragile. It cannot survive without a willingness to cope with the complexity of the world as it is. And that resonated with me because in this last campaign, I did it my way and we see how that worked out for me, right? <laughs> um, but there were many of my, of my votes and votes of the majority of the council um, that were raised. And they were really for the first time in my, in my political life in Burlington, these votes were characterized either intentionally or not in very simplistic and misleading ways. She voted for the F-35s, because there was never any vote, you know, yes or no on the f 35 She voted for the 14-story mall, completely distorting the downtown project. She voted to sell Burlington Telecom. Well, that's, that's a whole hour to kind of unpack how misleading and simplistic that is. And I do think that it is a responsibility of elected officials to help the public and candidates to help the public understand the complexity of the issues that this council deals with. And when we don't do that, we are doing the public a disservice, we are doing the city a, distur a, a disservice, and we are not living up to our obligations, I believe, as elected officials. This is all very influenced by my being an educator, and I think that facts should matter in Burlington and reasoned arguments should matter in Burlington. And let's not let it ever be different from that. Um, and, I, and I think reflecting back is that really the ultimate test of, of, your, of our success collectively is whether our decisions stand the test of time. And when I go back and I look at the F-35 vote, I look at the downtown project vote, I look at the Burlington Telecom vote, 
votes that we took, I think, I think so far it's pretty good. And I think we'll, we'll let the time go forward and we'll, we'll see what happens. But we've got a successful airport. We have a project that's moving forward. We're gonna have more people living downtown. So downtown won't be just a place for tourists. And we're going to have a telecom company that is, has strong connections to our economy, to our civic life. Um, and that I believe is going to be, is going to see even better days in the future than it has in, in, in this past period of time. Um, and I think that Burlington Telecom will be a way for full taxpayer recovery. But that will be a debate that the next council has. Um, and I, I wish the next council all the, all the best. I'll, I'll miss you. I'll miss you all. I'll miss the work. Um, but um, I wish you all the best in, in these decisions that you have coming forward. And I, I do believe they will require measured and mature decision making. And I have great trust in this body to, to kind of carry, carry that forward. Um, so with that, I would entertain with gratitude to all of you a motion to adjourn. Hartnett and Dean. There we go. That's the way to All in favor of adjourning at 1150 whatever it is. Three. Yeah. Three? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. It's unanimous. Aye.